Was malt whiskey better in the old days? Yes. And no. I'll see you in a wee minute. Hello whiskey folk, hello everybody, welcome to the V-Pub, welcome to another Thursday night hangout. I'm so excited to see so many of you waiting for the pub doors to open as usual and it's so, so reassuring to see that support every week. I really, really do appreciate it. I've got another guest on tonight, I think we've been spoiled, honestly speaking, for guests in 2021 so far. Um, it's been wonderful to welcome these people on and to get their insight and things, but I think a lot of you are going to detect the or detect that I have a special kind of excitement for the guy who's joining us tonight. And that's because you'll have heard me drop his name over the years of the VPUB. You'll have heard me mention him and talking about the effect that he potentially had on so many of the malt whiskies and the attitudes, honestly speaking, towards malt whiskies uh, that we enjoy today. Anyway, more about that in a wee minute. I'm going to jump straight into the, the lounge tonight and uh, just start to welcome some of you Hey, beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated barflies. So good to see you all. Wonderful. I'll do what I always do. I'll just be focusing on those orange uh, highlights that come up. So if you're trying to get my attention, um, just type Aquavite or at Aquavite and I should be able to see it. Uh, if the same, if you're trying to ask any questions tonight, do the same thing. Uh, Ronald is in. Good to see you, Ronald. Good to see you. He's saying good evening. Good to see you too. Uh, Faskar Math, he's saying. Um, fantastic, Ronald. W wonderful to welcome you in, my friend. Hans Waldman is here. Stefan Novak, Radex Dyskill, Pete Head, Jerry Miller. Great to see you, Jella, uh, Jerry. And Neil Cochran as well. Hans is saying good evening. Andrew Pierce, uh, Cameron Lochner, um, Graham Young. Good to see you, Graham, my friend. Good to see you. I was checking actually on your little bottle over my shoulder. Can you see it here? Uh, this is your Canadian rye whiskey with a chunk of applewood in it. It's actually starting to get some colour now, Graham. So we're maybe getting to the point that we can actually have a wee sample of that and see how it's getting on. Good to see you, and my friend. Good to welcome you. Uh, Hellswood is here as well. Fantastic to see you, Helen. Uh, Kenneth, Hannah, James Alsop. Chris is here. Wow, I had the volume way up loud there. Just about jumped out of my chair, he's saying. It's probably the bass in that intro music, Chris. It's worse if you've got headphones in, believe me. Watch out for that one. Uh, ben Demon Hunter is here. Good to see you, buddy. Bogdan is here. Bogdan Rilski. Let's try Rilski. I'll go with that. I hope I'm not butchering your name, my friend. It's good to have you in. Kirsty Frost is here. Good to see you. Love the intro music. Uh, it lets me know the weekend is nearly here. Do you know what, Kirsty? I, I think I have to keep the, the intro music. Um, even when I do lock-ins just for patrons, so it's just a much more informal, laid-back kind of chat type night, I still run the intro music because it's like a transitional thing. It helps me just get into that frame of mind that I'm actually live and it's the V-Pub. Uh, Jean Della Cuisine has just bought me a dram as well, John. It's uh, so good to have you. And he's saying, finally got around to drinking Michael Kerrin 16 sample. Fantastic stuff. Thanks again to Alistair for making that possible. Absolutely. I'm glad you're enjoying it as well. I think I'm down to about this much left in Michael Kerrin 16 bottle. Um, I have sampled and shared quite a lot of it, but I've really been enjoying it. And it's one of those bottles that does develop as it's open. Who else do we have? We've got Alistair, Alistair Gray, Phil's here, Whiskey Mystery, wonderful to see you, Phil. Magic is in as well, Desi Vleeland, Dram Mondays, Rule, Orange Rule, Prime Whiskey, the one Glassman Warner, so good to see you, my friend. Uh, Go Habs is here, Go Habs, what an, it's excellent to see you in, my friend, I hope you're doing well. Marcus Kreitner in Austria, Neil Laverty in Northern Ireland, Ryan Sutherland in Scotland, Ian Bowes, um, Stefan already mentioned that you're in, Stefan Overt, of course, over in Germany, Gary Carew, Stephen Gordon, so, so many of you. So many of you, and it's great to see you all in. Um, I'm going to try my very, very best to focus uh, on the questions and the comments and things coming in from everybody tonight. Um, I know that um, if the discussion goes the way I would like it to go, I am sure that it's going to invoke a lot of curiosity and questions from you, and I do encourage that. Got to say a wee apology to my friend uh, John Pallister. Um, I noticed when I was catching up on comments, <clears throat> I missed a, a super chat from him last week. 
Uh, when you do buy, buy me virtual drums, I do really try to catch them. And I apologize very much to my friend, John. Uh, I'll raise a glass now and say thanks very much, John, for your super chat. And uh, sorry, I missed it last week, my friend. I hope you'll forgive me. Cheers to you. Cheers. Also, I'll welcome in uh, Andy Wilson, who joined the, the Barflies. He became a member of the YouTube channel here just before we went live tonight. Um, and what that means is that you're able to get access to loyalty badges and emojis and different ways of uh, expressing yourself and things in the chat and the comments. But it also means that you're supporting the channel and it keeps it independent and it keeps it ad free. So for everybody that's watching it on the replay, I'm very, very grateful when you do that. Thank you very much. It means that you're not having to sit through ads when you drop in and out and split it up into chunks and listen to it podcast style. So thanks to all my amazing, amazing patrons as well and uh, the Aquavite Barflies as well for supporting the channel. Tonight's topic is, it could go in any direction, honestly. When I titled this kind of, is it nostalgia or whatever, I'm just kind of trying to get that, your mind in that place to try and compare whiskey and think about whiskey in the context of history. Um, and it's, if we, if we frame it in the window that we can actually still touch more or less. I mean, it's very, very difficult to get your hands on anything from the olden days, let's say, or certainly when it comes to malt, it's very, very difficult. That That's kind of in the hands of collectors. Um, it's pretty expensive now. Real, real uh, enthusiasts, or let's say enthusiasts that have been into whiskey for a long time, they've been able to try it in the past. Um, but it's expensive. If you were going to go back and try to get something from the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, or even the 80s nowadays, it's probably going to be much easier for you to get your hands on a blend. And that makes a lot of sense. But tonight's focus is not going to be about antique whiskies versus modern whiskies, because that's a whole other subject in its own right. That's a whole other thing where you're talking about things like um, aging in the bottle and old bottle effect and the fact that it's been sitting in glass for a long time. You're talking about the way that the production affected the whiskey back then, and you're talking about uh, blends versus malts and what malts were avail available back then. Tonight, we're talking about how whiskey has changed in terms of production, in terms of the attitude to specifically malt whiskey. If we imagine, let's imagine everything post war, the modern whiskey era. So post Second World War, we start to see that boom. Some people refer to it as the Hollywood boom, the idea where whiskey is becoming more and more popular. And as, as the demand increased and the capacity and the output increased, the focus throughout the 60s and into the 70s started to become one of chasing efficiency, chasing as high a yield as possible. And the malts, even back then, they were becoming more and more consistent decade by decade, of course, but they were wildly inconsistent. And you can imagine the quality probably wasn't number one when, the, when you're chasing yield and you know fully that your malt is going to be used to season a blend or to make up uh, a blend with multiple malts mixed with grain. And then what happened? We hit the 70s and we see this kind of huge downturn in the late 70s, this kind of fashion crisis, you could call it, where people start to pull away from brown spirits generally. And whiskey is a huge victim there as people chase wines and sparkling drinks and cocktails and vodka and clear spirits. And whiskey suffers as a as being perceived as an old man's drink. Then into the 1980s and things, things become really quite dark and we see all the closures that happened. It's quite amazing the amount of distilleries that we lost in that decade alone. But all the while that this is happening, malts stay strong and continue to grow, actually. It's quiet at first and they're building a slow steam in the background and it's, if you know, you know, and it's down to the enthusiasts and the, the connoisseurs, I guess they would have been back in the day. And then throughout the 80s and through the 90s, this starts to grow and grow and grow. As soon as we hit the turn of the century, we come into the 20th century, things are starting to grow really, really fast. If we go back to just before that fashion crisis happened, there are very few malts. 
There's literally just a handful of malts. And those that do exist, Glenmorangie, um, what else would have been back then? Of course, Glenfiddich that started in the 60s, Glenlivet would have been, been around. Um, there were malts, but there weren't many of them, certainly not many that were branded. And outside of that, you was maybe going to get independents and specialists or things that you were able to sell, uh, buy malts from. But there wasn't a lot being exported and there certainly wasn't a lot being branded. And what was branded followed in the blueprint of blends where consistency was the driver. Branded blends like Dures, Ballantines, like Johnny Walker, like all of these global brands that were trying to bring you a consistent product through blending year after year, bottling after bottling. And when Glenfiddich came along in the 60s and all the malts that followed putting a brand on the bottle, they followed that exact same blueprint, which meant 40% ABV, which meant filtration and time they came to understand the cosmetic effect of chill filtration and how that could keep a blend nice and clear. And that happened to the malts too. In time though, we realized that if you were to look at it today, the way that we enjoy single malts today and the things that we demand as enthusiasts, something happened along the way where we realized we were not handling our malts very well. And nowadays, if we're an enthusiast, we tend to, not always, we don't demand it, but we very strongly encourage, let's say, that the product is much more natural. I certainly do on this channel. We want to see the product without anything added and without anything taken away. That's all very, very recent. Malts certainly on the scale that we see today is very, very recent. And the way that they're presented to us and the amount of variation that we have and that natural idea is very recent too. How did that happen? Was it consumer driven? Even if it was consumer driven, who made it happen? Who was working away in the background? Who, was, who were speaking to their boards and in these kind of behind the scenes meetings to, to get attitudes to change, to get people to move away from that long-standing, consistent product that was a blend and to think about malt and maybe embracing the fact that it could be made better for malt's sake, maybe embracing the fact that it's okay to have a wee bit of batch variation for a very organic product. Who was behind the scenes there? Well, I'll tell you that I believe, I strongly believe that one of the people behind the scenes um, is the guy that's going to join us tonight. If you're trying at any point to get any questions into me, please try and use that. I don't always see it, but I'll do my very best to keep my eye on the chat. Um, hey, Hoyt is saying, hey, I fit that label now. I wonder what you're referring to, Hoyt. Um, you're talking about the, the time scales I'm talking about. Telex Whiskey Tech is in. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, Jason. He's saying, the older I get, does that mean I get more whiskey? <laughs> Love seeing you, I Hope to get over to Scotland post-COVID. That would be amazing, Telex. If you ever make plans to go over here, you have to let me know that you're arriving, my friend. That would be tremendous if you are making plans to come over. I know you're still doing your own content out there as well on the YouTube channel, Telex, the Whiskey Tech. So yeah, if you're trying to get questions across to us, um, you know, at any point, just try and uh, grab my attention. I'll do my very best to keep an eye on the chat as I'm focused on my guest tonight. I'm going to just bring my guest in as early as I possibly can. But I'll share with you a wee anecdote first. And it's telling. <laughs> I was researching a VPUB a couple of years ago. I don't know exactly, but I was researching uh, the, the practice of chill filtration and I was looking into it in some depth. Um, one website that I found, uh, there was a whiskey maker who was uh, mentioned over three separate articles talking about that very topic. I've since come to realise through research that again today that that website was scotchwhiskey.com and I found those articles again. And each time they talked about the concept of chill filtration, they talked about Ian McMillan and they talked about his significant changes across, at that time, the Burn Stewart distilleries before Distel was involved, of Tobermory, of Deanston and Bunahaven. And they talked about how 
uh, the whiskies had gone uh, from not just having a different production method and different things put in place in terms of how the grain was handled, how the fermentation was, the distillation, the cut points, but talking about how the maturation was changed, cask management becoming such a big issue. And then after all that careful, careful care, this guy in the background fighting for this natural presentation. I always had a suspicion that Ian McMillan was crucial to that, and it's only through recent discussions that I've discovered that that is absolutely the case. I'm really excited to uh, welcome into the VPUB, welcome behind the bar as our VIP for this evening, uh, uh, Ian McMillan. Ian, welcome to the VPUB, my friend. So good to see you. Good to see you, Ryan. Are you comfortable, Ian? Yes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm even more comfortable now. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, you've got a glass in your hand. So let's raise a wee glass to say hi, welcome to the VPUB. Cheers to you and good to see you. Cheers. Now I'll ask you, I know that I rambled a wee bit there, I was kind of all over the place, but what I want to do is talk about, we're not talking about antique versus uh, modern presentations of whiskey. There's lots of dynamics going on there. What we're speaking about is malt whiskey, how it was handled in the past, how it's handled today, um, in terms of how it's produced, um, how it's matured, and of course, how it's bottled and how it's presented to us today. Um, so when I talk about that, what I realise in the years, the decades that I'm framing, 70s, 80s, crucial, really, really boom to bust to late 70s into the closures of the 80s, and then that gradual crawl through the 90s and the 2000s. I'm actually talking about Ian McMillan's career, and I hope you don't mind me saying that. Tell me, when, did, when, did, when did you start out? Let's let's uh, let's talk about how you came into whiskey. Where did you start out, Ian? My first uh, job in the whiskey industry was at Glen Goyne Distillery uh, in 1973, where I I came out of of uh, college. I mean, all my sort of friends were all uh, like sort of apprentices and different things, and I had gone on to further education, but it was in Glasgow when I was living in Balfron. And uh, it just got to the point I... Ah, so really okay. So we've got a wee bit of serendipity <laughs> happening. Sorry to interrupt you, but just for the folk that are tuning in. But the neighbouring distillery to you then, the immediately close by distillery was going going to Balfron, right? It was, yes. It was only five miles away. And uh, I went down for an interview with the then manager and uh, he offered uh, me a position, you know, just to start at the beginning, um, filling casks, rolling casks, warehousing, and then learning the processes. I remember I went back to tell my parents that I was going to start at the distillery and drop out of the college, and they, they were all aghast. They thought, oh, that's it, you'll just become an alcoholic now, and that will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's interesting. And back in 1973, was dramming still a thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, very, very much so, yeah. Because, um, I mean, I know it's a wee digression, but I think it's cool because they've got the teapot dram from Glen Goyne that celebrates or or commemorates, let's say, let's not, not say celebrate, but it talks about that practice of dramming that people would get a cup or a measure or a dram of, I guess, very, very young, new make, maybe even spirit every day. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember it well. I mean, the... The fact was that Glen Goyne was quite different to a lot of distilleries because at Glen Goyne we got uh, mature whisky because uh, some of the, whoever was the lucky one went down with the brewer into the warehouse and selected the cask and then you got the job of siphoning it out into the bottle or into the jug as it was then and then they filled it into bottles. So, um, yeah, I mean, there was um, it, it wasn't a matter. If you were working on a day shift, you got a, you got a dram as soon as you started. Um, you got another one at uh, 10 o'clock for your tea. You got another one at lunchtime, and you get one before you went home. And what, what kind of size of drums are we talking about? Because we're not talking about this, are we? No, you're talking about uh, you're talking about this, half of that glass would be the measure. You know, and it's uh, it's amazing how you you build up a tolerance to it because the very first day, you know, I thought, oh, here I am, I'm 18 years old, I'm a I'm a man and all that, and I can handle whiskey. I had the first dram and it just about knocked me in my knees and I, and, it, and they threw me into the, all the bungs in those days for the casks were all cork. And so they came in big Hessian sacks. And so I was virtually passed out and they threw me in there and I slept in there for about two hours <laughs> to recover from that first dram. 
And it's amazing how you build up tolerance after all that. Aye, aye, I can imagine because we're talking about no dilution, we're talking cask strength. Well, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, all the, all the guys that I worked with in those days were all older. I was the youngest guy in the place, and uh, a lot of some of the guys have been in there for years, you know. And uh, I, I always remember there was a guy that worked with me then. And I learned a lot from him because he, he was a stillman, and he'd been a stillman for years and years. And um, he, he only had one eye. He, unfortunately, um, Frank only had one eye. But I'll tell you one thing. He could pick out the, the glass with the most whiskey in it from, from 10 metres. <laughs> <laughs> you only need one eye on a glass, right? That's all you need. So that's that's quite amazing to me. And it's, if we, we go back, I mean, 1973... You know, you, you're you're that's kind of you're starting out in your whiskey career. It wasn't what you envisaged. It wasn't a dream or anything. It was just a place that you found yourself. And I think as the conversation goes along tonight, we're going to weave through your um your career. We're going to weave through you going on to work at Port Dundas, at other distilleries. I believe mm -hmm. Glen Turret and things, all the way as you lead up yeah. to your time at Burn Stewart, a quarter century at Burn Stewart. And then go off to do uh, things at, at Bladnock before you end up where you are today. Um, and, and there's no brand behind you today. You're speaking as a complete independent because you are a private consultant these days, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I came out of that and I realised after I had uh, completed the Bladnock uh, renovation project that there was a lot of people were in a similar position to the, the, the owner that had bought over Bladnock that people were needing advice and uh, assistance in either renovating or or new building of distilleries all over the world. Absolutely. And I know that through speaking to you on the run-up to setting up this this evening, um, you're kept pretty busy with that, um, e even, even despite, uh, you know, current situation that we're, obviously you can't travel, things you can't no. go out and visit these sites and things. Um, but but that's interesting because there isn't a there isn't a brand behind you, so we don't have a we do have a lineup of kind of whiskies, but it's more a kind of they're all kind of chapter markers in, in Ian McMillan's kind of career, I think, rather than uh, you know here's your latest kind of thing that that, that you, that's got your name on it. I think so much of what I've come to enjoy over the years, it's amazing how much of it has perhaps been at the hands of Ian McMillan. But I think we'll get to that in time. So how long did you spend at Glen Goyne in the seventies? I was at Glen Goyne for, for, for three years, um, from 73 mm -hmm. till 76. You know, I was still living at Balthron and I got to then that I wanted to move out and uh, um, move out of my parents' home and get my own place. And so I, I moved to Glasgow and uh, I, I had applied and got a job at Portland Das, which was very different because it was grain whiskey distilling. I had yep. come from the malt whiskey side. I had learned everything there be, and went on to become Mashman and then Stillman and, and having carried out all that. So when I went to um, Portland Das, whole new different prospect uh, and in a massive scale in comparison, you know, there was, I mean, the the, the mash size at Glen Goyne was like 3.7 uh, tons with a, you know, uh, like a, um, a 20,000 litre fermenter. I was suddenly moving into um, mash sizes uh, of like 30 tonnes um, and uh, fermenters of like uh, um, 240,000 litres, you know, there were, ten, it was ten times the size, yeah. So if we if we go back to the 70s then, so you've you've built up a few years experience and then you've moved into grain distilling, but if we yes. talk, look at Glen Goyne, give us a snapshot of because there's a fantastic range from Glen Goyne today. We've got the 10, the 12, the 15 is temporarily discontinued. We've got the 18, we've got the 21, 25 more. There's lots of non-e-statement ones and special editions as well. Huge core range. What was what was it like back in Glen Goyne in the, in the early 70s? Could you even buy a, a malt with Glen Goyne on the label? Yes, the, that was one of the rare things about Glen Goyne in those days was owned by Lang Brothers and... Uh, I recall um, just about every Friday, uh, the owner uh, was Stuart Lang, and he would come out in his chauffeur-driven car and visit the distillery um, every Friday. And, and uh, he was a big 
a very tall man uh, with with uh, white hair. I always remember him. He always spoke to everybody. He was a really fine, art, art, articulate man. And in, in, in those days, obviously, the biggest majority of Glengoyne went into the Lang's um, uh, brand or uh, blend, which in those days was very popular. It was all over the place. You know, Lang's been an ind independent company, but they did bottle an expression of Glengoyne as an eight-year-old. Um, I remember it was a it was a an awful label, you know. It just was a, it was like an all green and black label. It just didn't look good at all. But it was an eight year old single malt, which there was there wasn't a lot of them around in those days. Yeah, and there's uh, certainly no branded ones like that. I mean, it'd be interesting to see. I remember trying um, a late seventies. Charlie McLean bought a lot of antique bottlings for the SNWS um, mm -hmm. through in Queen Street uh, in Edinburgh. And two of the bottles that he bought was an eight and a ten. I think it was eight and ten year old Glengoyne from the seventies, um, and it was fascinating to be able to try them back to back. But if, so, if you go back to those days, what you're talking about there, and especially your perspective of being at Glengoyne for malt and then moving into Port Dundas for grain, you, you've then got a really good vision of kind of the the market the, or the the industry producing for blends. So, yes. what the percentage of malt whiskey we're speaking about? Maybe one or two percent was bottled as malt. It was round, it'd be round about that. Maybe a couple of per percent. I mean, because the really only the biggest one was obviously uh, Glen Fiddock, and then it was Glen Livet was around as well. But there there wasn't a huge lot of other ones. All the the biggest majority of all the Diageo ones when they they were a blended company. I mean, even to this day, they still claim themselves to be a blended whiskey company yeah. because yeah. that's. Uh, burns it pays for all the bills as such, but um, there there wasn't a lot of single malts, and there wasn't a lot of people that actually drank single uh, single malts either. Because although all the guys at the distillery, the drams that we got uh, as your during your, your your drams was all single malt, and there was uh, you you began to really be really appreciate the the flavour of that of that individualism of that particular single expression and uh, and then we would get used to because it would all come from different casks because in those days we were filling sherry casks as well uh, ex bourbon barrels there was a wide range of different casks and we also filled for a number of independent merchants as well but that was mostly for for blends too uh, but it was it was really interesting getting the the the, the single malt and then you could taste it you wanted to Taste it. So I remember when it was my turn to to uh, siphon the the into the jug for the drums. I would go and pick an older one. So I wanted to, I wanted to taste what Glen Glen was like at twelve years old or whatever. <laughs> a darker one, a more mature one. Yeah, um, there was some really nice casks there. Yeah. I am. Um, uh, Graham Fraser is asking: Is it true that dramming came about to stop pilfering? Well, dramming was uh, was was one of the ways that yeah. I mean, pilfering never really stopped, but they always felt the fact is that if you were offering a dram to people, then they wouldn't be as inclined to to, to go looking for it because they so knew I, it was coming anyway. So it was a kind of a cheap reward, and I and I think it's probably more of the the health issues and the accidents on the job and the long term effects that killed that off in the late seventies, right? Well, well, there there was. I mean, there was there was. I mean, it wasn't just the guys that got the dram. I mean, the people that anybody that came into the distillery at dramming time. It was. I mean, it was it was incredible. People that were, that were driving trucks and things like that come in. They came up and lined up as well, and they got their dram too. You know, the 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 farmer next door would come in and get a get a dram too if he if he was of that notion. Anybody that was was working, any builders or tradesmen on site. They would get a dram as well, you know. There was nobody was uh, was refused. I remember being a kid in the seventies, and I remember being driven by adults that were in no fit state to be near <laughs> the controls of a car or whatever. I remember what it was like. Jimmy Legs asked an, an excellent question as well, talking about port and dasses. You, you move into grain distilling, and he's asked, "How is it decided what grain is used?" And I think he's talking about is it wheat or corn. Um, and was it solely based on uh, price or was it perhaps availability or whatever? It was mostly based on price. I mean, and when I first went to uh, Port and Das, as with the majority of the all the grain distilleries in Scotland in those days, they were all using, it was all maize or corn. So it was maize was the, the crop that we could get. Maize was, um, 
it had to be cooked under pressure to to um, make the uh, the starch available so that it could be converted into a, to a sugar. And we always used the uh, green green malt. And uh, at Portland Das, we had a malting plant on site there where the malt was never dried, but it was turned into green malt, of which was then blown into the into the mash tun along with the with the the cooked uh, maize. Um, so wheat started to get introduced as it became available in price. It was more, it became quite difficult to process um, because uh, to, 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 to get it right, the, the, uh, the, we had got used to using maize really much and then wheat came in and it, it became easier to process. And it was always, and we, we became used to that and then suddenly we'd be switched back to, to uh, maize again. And then it was always a that tricky bit of adjusting yeah. your plan to, to 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 get it right. But it was all down to um, to price. But I must admit, I mean, uh, as a grain distiller as I was, and having experienced both, I have always favoured uh, grain whiskey made from maize. From uh, I think it's got more body. It's got more meat. It's got a, a little tang to it. I, I really like the body of it. And there's only one distillery really of a scale that makes that still and has always used maize is the North British distillery in Edinburgh. All the rest, I believe, are all using wheat now. And I think that that's got a lot to do with exactly what you talk about there. Once you set the plant up for one grain, the, the most efficient thing to do is to stick to that grain. Well, they, they can do it. I mean, I, I mean, North British, I believe, continued using maize because it was a preferable, the, the spirit that was distilled was more preferable. And it was more in demand than what, because they had they had used wheat as well, but the spirit was not as uh, as um, des desirable for blenders um, as the, the the ones made from from maize. And so they continued, and they always have done, you know. And I've had been very fortunate to have drank some very old North British um, whiskies, and and there are, there are some of them are quite mag magnificent, uh, yeah. you know. Don't let anyone ever tell you that grain whiskey doesn't mature because I can assure you it does. Oh no, absolutely, I agree. And and while it's while it is to, to to me, to my palate, to my perception, it is a different drink. It still can be absolutely fabulous, especially if it's been left honestly in a quiet cask for a long time, and then it's been it's it's, a, it's been allowed to kind of mature, uh, uh, you know, without any kind of aggressive. That you know, this is just my take on it. And then you get to taste this really wonderful me mellow mature spirit uh, honestly speaking an affordable price relative to its malt counterparts and um, yes. you can still buy very mature grain at a reasonable price but it does i mean when you're blending as well i mean i was over always a big favor uh, when when i was making the the different blends at, at, at uh, Burn, Burn Stewart, the scottish leader and uh, and black bottle and such i my predominant grain was always North British. I did use some of the other um, wheat uh, distilleries as well, but I really, really liked um, the the effect and uh, the, the the finished product and the contribution that that North British maize spirit made. Fantastic, and I think we're going to touch a wee bit more on your experience as a grain distiller a bit later when we get onto the topic of mm -hmm. actual filtration. Um, Graham Fraser is asking, so did Ian learn his trade solely by hands-on experience or did he undertake any scientific training or education? What are we talking about? It's, it's a hands-on thing, Ian, isn't it? Yes, well, well, it was. I mean, for, for, for me, it was all um, hands-on, although um, when I was transferred uh, eventually down to spend some time in London and dist uh, distilling gin, um, the company then asked me to go and do some courses at night school to uh, learn the chemistry, uh, to uh, study some organic chemistry and understand the basics and such. So I, I did courses there as there as well. But but in Scotland, I was very fortunate that, uh, um, the as I said, the first manager that I worked for at Glen Goyne was a, a man called Lewis Patterson. And Lewis was a, a real character, but he was a really genuine guy. He liked a dram and he could chat for, for hours, but he was the one that pushed me to learn everything. He was the one that was behind me all the time. And I never ever for, forgot him for that. And I, I, when I returned uh, and I got the chance to meet up with him, with him again, um, 
oh, about probably seven or eight years ago. He unfortunately died a couple of years ago, but I was very pleased that I got to, to meet him a number of times after that to really thank him for what he had pushed me into learning and made me want to learn more. And That's then... It. Then you move on, uh, um, Roy. You you move on and you and you learned. I mean, I there was people at uh, Portland Das that you know the the different shift managers then that were when I first started, in which I then became a shift manager. But I learned from guys. They had been in the job for thirty years, you know, and you just learn from these. And I was fortunate to have been able to have worked with guys that had been in the industry for a long time, and and you learn so so much much about that. Do you think that's still happening in the industry today? I don't think it's as much. Um, I don't think the opportunities that are there as much as they used to be um, because um, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of automation now, which is not a big favourite point of mine. I'm a, I'm a real traditionalist, you know, and uh, I kind of uh, shy away from uh, complete automation. I'm not a big fan of that because... I do believe, honestly, that it'll, it'll, it, it will lead to eventually a, a blindness in, in whiskey, which won't be noticeable for many years. But it's the human element that really, the, the art of the still man cutting it off the non-spirit, because each still man's perception and view and such of reading a hydrometer and that is slightly different. And so you're going to get this uh, this human element in selecting the, the uh, spirits, the cut points yeah. and such. And uh, that's where I think a lot of the character is in whiskey. And you learn that from the guys. As I said, the the old stillman at Glengoyne, I mean, the, the three stillmen when I went there had all been there. They, I mean, the, the youngest serving one, I think, was just, had just completed 20 years. You know, and it was incredible that the older one that eventually retired, I got his his job. And, you know, and... And I was only a couple of years in the place. Then I was a still man for a for a year until I moved. I moved on to Portland Das. That's amazing. So always, amazing. And it's, and when we talk about nostalgia and whiskey, and we talk about these people that love these tropical sixties bemores and things, things that I can't afford or touch, or um, you know, very very occasionally you get a wee sip of something like this at a festival or something. But these days are gone for us to enjoy that. But when they when they speak nostalgically let's say and and affectionately about these old whiskey i think that's what you're talking about the days when there was a, a lot of kind of human hands a lot of human input onto things but it could lead to variation it could lead to um you know things being um filled or potentially just thrown into <laughs> casks before casks were fully understood or and sometimes you would have a magical thing happening and other times you would have just something plain average or worse happening um, as, as time's gone on, have you also over, as you've witnessed more automation come in, have you witnessed any kind of improvement in the understanding of the impact of mashing, of fermentation, of the grains used, of distillation, and specifically um, of cask management? Or is have you witnessed a, a, a significant well. As far as production is concerned, yeah, I mean, the uh, production has become much more consistent and more con controlled. The varieties of barley are much more um, controlled as well. They, they all go through um, really rigid tests before they're, uh, they're approved um, uh, for use. And so, and the same with, with yeast, uh, yeast strains as well. These have all I mean, there was. I mean, when when I first started, the yeast came in little drums as well, and it was, and and you, you know, it used to be quite difficult to, to to get the yeast out of these drums and such. But there certainly has been a, um, the quality can control. Would this have been a brewer's yeast or a distiller's yeast? Well, we used to use a blend of both. You use brewers and distillers yeast. So, um, but it certainly is more con controlled now nowadays, and you know. Fortunately, I mean, I mean, I've been very fortunate in, in my time in the business that I have tasted whiskies that were distilled um, a way back in the 30s and, and 40s and such and matured and such. I mean, I have tasted some quite remarkable quality of whiskies, but I've also tasted some awful, awful whiskies as well, you know. Um, and I don't 
think you you don't get that nowadays. You know, I've tasted whiskies nowadays, nowadays where you know you the the quality control is there, and uh, but occasionally you get some bottlings that are, that are done that you really question why would MD want to put that into a bottle, you yep. know, and and uh, unfortunately some of the very small independents have no alternative if they're not making a blend. If we had some poor whiskey, you could dump it in and lose it in a, a large batting and such. Yeah. But small, some of the smaller ones are, are working on a real shoestring, and so they have to bottle something. And I can remember someone uh, wanting me to come and taste this wonderful Bunahaven. It was at a, a whiskey uh, live event in South Africa, and he was thinking this was the best thing he'd ever had was this, was this Bunahaven. Um, it was like a 25 or 26 year old, you know, honestly, I went to it and I, I didn't want to be so rude to him, but I was not uh, impressed by it at all. So much so that he'd written everything on the front of it, uh, of the, the cask number, the, the, the AYS and everything on it. So I noted that down and when I got back to Scotland again, I looked it up to, to, to look at the cask history of that and it was a cask that I had uh, rejected. I had scored it off and said use for blending, but oh, wow. uh, <laughs> one of our commercial people had uh, been, so, when it, when I hadn't earmarked a cask, it suddenly became available for for sale. But I had said that this one should either be disposed of, or so so they thought disposing of it means it could be sold. So unfortunately, it was sold, and I believe they paid a good sum of money for it. So that's the that's the downside. So there there, there are stars Roy for which I've tasted uh, distilled in those days and and there have been absolute horror shows as well aye absolutely and, and I think what's interesting is that if we enjoy or we connect with and I know that tonight's focus isn't on antique whiskies and things but when we do get a chance to connect with these antique whiskies at a tasting a master class or a festival um, and it's sold to you from a vendor, that vendor's opened that bottle and knows that it's a good example, knows that it's not corked in the bottle, knows that the bottling is a good one as well. Um, but they're not going to kind of, they're not going to be selling a lot of these antique whiskies that were duds. They're not going to have much success doing no. that. And so okay. it helps that rose-tinted vision, that nostalgia of the past. This is just my opinion, of course. I think that you look <laughs> back on the, those um, antique whiskies. And while you could have these amazing peaks, as you say, you could have these real deep troughs. So what 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 I think we're, what we're trying to tease out tonight is where that baseline is, Ian, versus versus the old days. T tell us after you move on then from your days, how long were you at Port Dundas doing grain distillation, and where did you uh, go? What led you up to Burn Stewart? I was at Port Dundas then for for six years, and it was obviously in those days Port Dundas was owned by the Distillers Company Limited or. The, the DCL had two sections, the, the SGD and SMD, Scottish yeah. Malt Distillers and Scottish Grain Distillers. Yeah. And in those days, we had we had um, um, five distilleries, you know, five grain distilleries and about 39 malt distilleries. You know, a lot of these are gone now. Um, there's, there's, there's none of the... The only grain one that's left now is, is um, Cameron Bridge. Yeah. All the other ones... What you're talking about is what, who we know as Diageo, in modern terms, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, and so um, it was then that um, I got the the opportunity to go down to London because they're still owned by the by the DCL. They owned a company down there called John Watney. Now people think John Watney is a brewer, but that's John. But there was a John Watney Distilling Company as well. It was part of the of the DCL who um, made a neutral spirit which was then taken to all the, the gin distilleries. There was quite a, a big gin, a few gin distilleries in then in London. And when I went down in 83, um, I was uh, I was working for a short period at the John Watney distillery in the to help commission these new stills they'd put in because they were very similar in the stills that we had at Portland Das, except they had additional columns to neutralise uh, the spirit. And then I was... Because of my experience working with pot stills, they asked me to go and work at uh, Booth's Distillery and the uh, original uh, Gordon's Distilleries as well. And they had one, they had, uh, they had two Booth's Distilleries and one Gordon's at that time in London, and I worked at the three of them. 
So this was back in the day when London was a distilling city. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it definitely was. Um, uh, it's incredible that when uh, when I uh, uh, became a member of the Worshipful Company of Distillers, my um, uh, on, on my uh, plaque it, it said, um, and it was, and I was one of the authentic ones, Ian McMillan, uh, um, a, a distiller of London. And and I was because I had actually distilled in London, and it was a it was an it was it was an exciting time because uh, um, working with these different stills and the I mean the the Red Line Distillery uh, that um, Booths had at, at uh, Brentford in those days was an absolutely beautiful distillery. The pot stills were were stunning, you know. And even the when you went up to the the ones up at Clerkenwell Road in the city of London, there was the Booths and the Gordon's distillery there. And that's where the legendary old old Tom uh, pot still was installed. It was in the Gordon's uh, plant there. And, you know, it was a 19th century um, still, riveted still, which is still in existence today, except it's now up in Cameron Bridge in Fife. Um, <laughs> so I've always thought I should pop in and say hello to it again, you know. <laughs> there was a missed opportunity for a quiz question right there. That would have been a good one. There is old Tom. There you, there you go. Yeah. Um, Graham Fraser is asking. I suppose I get. Uh, I suppose to get different character from single malts, you need to buy single cask bottlings today. Uh, so that's what, as Graham Fraser. I think what he's reflecting on there is maybe the idea that as we become more uh, consistent, what we have to guard ourselves against, and I think you've touched on it, Ian, is that concept, that spectre of potential homogenization of, yeah. of spirit becoming quite bland. Um, and, and I know that, that through various distilleries up and down the place, they've got different campaigns where they distill in a different way, um, yeah. maybe using different grain, peated at different levels, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, then all the flexibility we have through distillation with cut points and things and, and then on to maturation. But, but yeah. he's making a good point is that does that mean that we're then reliant on casks to get variation from whiskey? I, I think not necessarily, right? Well, the, I mean, the cask does contribute, um, you know, 75, 80, 80 percent of the, the overall flavor to, to a whiskey. You know, single cask bottlings are great, but a single cask bottling from a distillery is not representative of that distillery because a single cask, like you've said, is, is that unique uh, expression because the, there might have been a cask that was filled the same day that was slightly different to it. Um, um, and it would be a different flavour altogether. Um, the represent uh, the the it would, that would only be indicative then um, a, a single cast bottling. You know the overall um, representative sample of a distillery would be a number of casks put together each time it's bottled to to make sure there's a consistency of that style going going forward. But I mean I'm a big when I mean I enjoy single cast when I find. Uh, a cask that is absolutely stunning. I mean, I like to bottle that that cask as it is because I I just don't want to to uh, mix it with anything else. You might find two casks or three that are very similar, and I've done that be before and just blended the two or three of them together to to get something really special. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I do like these very limited runs as well because that's something that is very special and. And, and unlikely to be repeated again. You know, it's, it's unusual Absolutely. that you'll find something again. And so these one-off bottlings are, uh, yeah, very very memorable and great for the con uh, for the consumer to experience too. Absolutely, and I think from time to time we've touched on it over various VPUBs where there is an exemplary or an exceptional or something really quite characterful or different, something to celebrate about a single cask, where it deserves to be treated as a single cask and bottled as such. But I think the problem that we have today that we're starting to see is the demand for single cast bottlings are so high that there's lots of samey, samey, fairly bang average things just end up getting bottled and labeled as single cast. And we understand that. We understand why it exists. And of course, there is a demand for it. But I think it's interesting what you say there that 70%, 75% plus percent of the, of the flavor potentially is from the cask. And also, yeah. when you find an exemplary cask, that's the one that you're interested in bottling. It's very interesting, either as a single or a small batch fatting, as you say. 
that's that's interesting to hear. I'm going to jump into the chat before I take you for a wee trip down memory lane, a wee Ian okay. McMillan memory lane trip. Um, Hoyt is saying, dumping a cask in, that sounds like, oh, he's having a shot at Ardbeg there, that sounds like Ardbeg serendipity. I potentially, they, they framed that as an accident, didn't they, Hoyt, of course. And Jimmy Leggett is saying, not bland, but as Serge would say, modern. <laughs> that's right, as Serge's polite way of talking about homogenised whiskey, potentially. Um, and Jimmy Leggett is saying, I don't care if it's representative, um, I want new experiences. Um, well, that's why you're chasing the things that you're chasing, Jimmy. That's why you're going after that kind of flavour chase and you're quite happy to embrace single casks and things. Wouldn't it be yeah. easy if you knew the reassurance that it's a single cask, so it's been bottled for an exemplary, characterful, something special has made that being bottled as a single cask, which I don't think is a reassurance we're uh, able to enjoy in modern times, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, Ryan Sutherland is saying, uh, can Ian share what projects he is currently working on? Curious to know where his knowledge is being put to work post Bladnick. I think what we'll do is round out tonight. I'm going to try and map our discussion around your career because it's hard to wrap your head around 48 <laughs> years, Ian. And so we'll try, we'll try and walk through and, and when we finish up and, and uh, obviously you brought Bladnick back online and have fully refurbished. There's very little existing from what it was before in that very short space of time there. What you're doing today, and I think as Ryan's asked, I think it would be good to get a, a kind of a, a resume, if you like, of what you're what you're involved in today. Alexandru Sochu is in. Um, he's in latest single cast from Dunville, sold in two minutes. Demand, it's insane. It's crazy just now, but there's lots of reasons for that, and we've touched on that in VPubs as well. It's not just the enthusiasts that's driving that. It's the investors, the collectors, the speculators, the... Everything is, we're, we're fighting a, a lot of dynamics in whiskey right now, absolutely. Ian, I'm going to pour another dram. And as I do, yeah. I'll, I'll give I'll walk down memory lane a wee bit. Um, yeah. I'll tell you what I've just finished sipping. Um, I finished, uh, I was sipping a Buna Haven 12. Uh, but it wasn't this. This is the Buna Haven 12 that we all kind of uh, recognise. Yeah, this yeah. is the 12 year old as it is today. This is, um, and I know that you're, you've, it's five years since you've been at Burn Stewart, of course, or Distel. Um, but this is close to Ian McMillan's Buna Haven, let's say. This is the, the presentation that you put in place. And this is what it replaced. This is the old Buna Haven 12. And this is what I've just had a wee glass of. Um, yeah. And the difference here is, and I hope people see that 40% ABV. On yeah. here, it's very similar bottling. If you look at these two glass bottles, you might be able to see that they're they're very very similar. Just one's green and one's a kind of dark brown glass. But on the new bottle, it, it mentions filtration. It talks about un, being unchill filtered. It's at forty six point three percent, whereas the old one that I've just finished. So the one I'm going to pour actually is the kind of newer one, and I'll, I'm going to show you the same thing. Um, and we'll see a pattern here as I show you these. Um, a couple of these bottles actually I pulled in from a friend of mine. Uh, we've got, now this is a 12 year old these days, but do you remember this Ian? Oh, very, very much so, yeah, yeah. This is the old pre-Ian McMillan's uh, stamping of feet and banging of fist, I guess, at Tobermory <laughs> 10 at 40%. And this is Ian McMillan's version of Tobermory 10. Again, at 46.3% and unchilled yeah. filtered as well. And we see the same pattern as well on, on Lechik. I've got two, two fantastic Lechiks to show you here. This is a Lechik that we recognise of today. 10-year-old, 6.3%. Yeah. Really, I get through a ridiculous amount of this because it's great value too. We'll maybe touch on Lechik. Um, and one of the one of the many releases from the distillery at the oh, time. Of the oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, look, yeah. I can see you shaking your head at this. And th interestingly... Yeah. This is 42%. And did you not yeah. comment that that's as much as they would let you get away with? <laughs> that was it. That was right. I mean, I mean, it was just they were desperate to get something out on sale uh, into certain markets, I know. And that, that whiskey in there is six years old. Okay, uh, in, in this bottle, yeah. And you can see, I mean, what is encouraging about it is you can see why it's been put together because this is as pale as Chardonnay. I've admitted to you that I think this is the bottle in my collection that's been open the longest. And I... <laughs> I was thinking yeah. about this quite hard, and I think that I think this was gifted to me in two thousand and nine, and I think it was opened pretty much straight away. So we're going anywhere between ten and twelve years that this has been open. Now I yeah. tried the I tried the wee drama of this uh, a couple of nights ago, uh, last night actually, um, 
and I, it's pretty flat, but there's still a lot there. There's a lot of flavour there. I'm not saying it's yeah. the best of flavour, um, but it is still, it's still quite alive. It's still very much whiskey. I mean, it's not gone off or anything. But that's quite a remarkable change over just those whiskies I've, I've shown you there. Well, we're going to talk about Deanston in a minute because we, we all have our favourites, whether it's uh, the Tobermory Distillery or the Lechick from Tobermory, whether people are really in love with the Buna Havens and things. But I've really come to trust modern Deanston um, as well. And, you know, I, I went to Deanston. There were uh, years ago I went to Deanston and I bought a bottle of Deanston and I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm not in a hurry to go back there again. Um, this is one from, uh, it was a gift to me from my cousin Kevin, who's out there on YouTube land. He he yes. bought it and he brought it along. We opened it together. And, of course, unfortunately, the, one of the problems with antique whiskies like this is that they're often corked. This one is corked. Yeah, yeah, I've sent you a wee sample of this, and I hope that you can uh, stick your nose in it. But you've already admitted yeah. that you you didn't love this whiskey, even at seventeen oh, years was, old. That was not a favourite of mine, and it, it it wasn't me that approved that one for bottling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it, what's amazing is that that would have been made with old Deanston before it yes. was made with the the production changes and the modification that was put into place. So the building blocks to put that seventeen year old together would have been not nearly as nice as the building blocks they have today to make this absolute peach of a whiskey. Yes, yes. This uh -huh. is the, Einstein, the modern version of the Einstein at 18 years old. So we're speaking about something that was produced at the turn of the century or 2001, 2002 of that order um, when we're buying it with this label on it and this packaging. Um, yeah. And I have to say, it's either me, the way I progress in my whiskey journey and the things I start to enjoy more and more, or this is getting better every single year it comes out. And I think that every time I enjoy this whiskey like this, I always have a little kind of doff of my cap, you know, just um, imaginary little kind of nod to Ian McMillan. And I know that the reason I can just blindly go in and trust modern Lechick from Tobermory, Tobermory from Tobermory, <laughs> modern Bunahaven and modern Deanston, this century, let's say, is because I know the cha the hand that you had in those distilleries. So you've gone and you've done your your time away. You've done your sabbatical in London, um, or or you know gone off to to do gin distillation. Yeah. You come back into Scotland, and eventually, I think through Glen Glen Turret first, you end up. Yeah. At well, were I you, uh, were you Glen Turret for long? I was at Glen Turret um, for um, about two and a half years. I was at Glen Turret, but. You know, Glen Turret, I knew it was privately owned then. It was the um, the Fairley family that, that had it then. It was uh, uh, James, the, who, uh, the father, um, was um, wanted to step back a bit, and he was the one that was really the, running the distillery as such, and they needed somebody that could come in and take over that production side of it. So I moved back up from London back to... To, I mean, it was quite a, a shock to the system. I moved from London to live in Creef. You know, it was like in those days, I thought I'd move to the moon because, you know, Creef in those days, every shop closed at five o'clock and there was nothing really open after that. It was it was a nightmare, you know, but um, I was glad to be back up and, and getting back into my first love, which was malt distilling again. Although I hadn't been away from from pot stills for that long, because I'd been working with the pot stills in the gin distilling um, in London, along with, with the column stills too. So, um, and then um, in early 1991, I I got the opportunity to apply for the role at uh, with with Burton Stewart, who had just purchased Deanston Distillery from Invergordon Distillers, and. Uh, I mean, it meant when I knew obviously where the distillery was because, uh, um, you know, um, having come from Balfron, you knew you knew the area quite sure. quite well. I knew it was a big cotton mill, and I knew it was a distillery had been converted because, in my days at, at Glengoyne, all our pot ale and and draft was taken to Deanston because they had a, a treatment plant and a, a that made a, a animal feeds, so they took all the draft from. Uh, from um, Glen Goyne, uh, Tully Barden, and in those days, Auchentoshan. And it was all taken up to Deanston to be processed and made into 
um, pellets for cattle feed. So sure. I knew very well of it. So when I went down and I, I met up with the, the then chairman and MD, the chairman was Bill Thornton and the MD was Billy Walker. And uh, we, we hit it off really well um, early days there. And I got a call a couple of days later from, from Billy offering me the role of which I was delighted to accept. And so from that day, from 91, uh, right through, it was a, another um, great guy to, to work with as, with, with as well and a great influence on, on me again as we went on. And Billy was great because he left me a, a lot to do um, to bring the distillery back up. And, uh, and the same as when we took on Tobor Mori as well, he just said to me, just get, get on about it and get it, get it running, get it consistent, get the spirit right. And, and we worked together really well. And it was from working with Billy that I got into, he knew that I had developed, and I had always had a good uh, organoleptic ability, being, being able to differentiate on whiskies and maturing whiskies. And so he encouraged me more and more in working along with him in blending. And that's how I became much more and became more involved in blending as well. And uh, and having worked with, uh, because Billy was, a, he, his role covered a, a multitude of, of uh, roles. He was uh, involved in sales. He was the, the, he was the joint MD for a period. He was sales director. He was involved in a lot. He was doing a lot of com commerce as well. So um, it was great to be trusted by Billy to run the distilleries. And then also be his support uh, uh, with them. Um, Production the level. Yeah. Uh, he was a fascinating guy. We had Billy on last year and we, we had him under the guise of the serial entrepreneur and, and yeah. the projects that he's gone on to do through Glen Glassell, Glen Dronach, Ben Riak, and, and now at Glen Allachy. And it was fascinating to speak to Billy. And it's fascinating to consider back in the 19, because if we're talking about that rebuild or that, that building up of Deanston, we're, we're going back into the 1990s, and it would be the yes. late 90s that Tober Mori came on stream, and then maybe um, just at the turn of the century for Buna Haven, would that be right? It, it was 90, uh, Burner Stewart bought uh, Tober Mori in 1993. Right, okay, so very quickly, yep. It was, it was two years after we had bought uh, uh, Deanston, and by that time, Deanston had, after that two years, I'd got Deanston making a style of spirit that we were happy with. It was consistent. It was. It then became really interesting for reciprocal tradings with other distillers. And so uh, the company needed to be recognized more and needed access to more uh, whiskey. And the opportunity to buy uh, Tober Mori uh, came about uh, in 1993. And uh, and I was sent up there to, to look it over and, and see, I mean, it, it was in a pretty pretty rundown condition. Um, it was owned by a, a, an independent, a sort of um, a, what shall I say? It was a, an entrepreneurial Yorkshireman <laughs> who I will who I will forever rem remember. Used to wear this big kipper tie, and every time I met him, he, he had this massive soup stain on the front of his tie, <laughs> <laughs> and that stuck with me in my, my memory forever. Um, <laughs> He was a very jolly character, but he knew very little about uh, running the distillery. And he brought in different n a number of people to come in and run the distillery for it. And they would, they would only stay for short periods of time. And and uh, the, the distillery needed to be taken over by a business or a company that could give it the, the care and attention that it, that it needed, spend the money on it and bring it back into, into proper production. So after a few years... And then it was 96 before I reintroduced the production of the Lechig uh, whiskey there as well. Um, because Lechig is the name of the area that this, the distillery is yeah. built on. And uh, we used that, that name. Previously, some people had called it Lechig Distillery, but it was originally Tober Mori Distillery. And it went through different owners, and some owners had called it Lechig. And so I decided to use the Lechig name for the the peated style or the, the phenolic the distillate and keep Tobor, Tobor Mori for the, the, the unpeated style. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. 
And what and what what we what we see starting to build there, and it's funny just hearing you put it into the context of time, is that Billy eventually went off to do other things, being the, the guy that Billy was. Um, but what we start to see, I think, is that is that as you're in the background and you're taking care of this whiskey, and I often kind of use the analogy of like a, a parent and a child. You know, you're 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 kind of raising this child and it's this developing. And whether you use the analogy of production as time goes on, or whether you put it in a cask and look at it that way. But you're you're working away, you're working with Deanston till the morning, and eventually you would also be doing the same to bring uh really an unloved distillery on Isla, Buna Haven, as it was at the time yeah. before before the yeah. changes. You would have had to so you're you're kind of it's almost like you're given these kind of difficult children. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're being asked to just kind of knock the corners off a wee bit, just raise the game a bit, make them kind of focus on being what the best that they can be not trying to make them anything else, get the best out of Deanston that you can and push it off in that direction. Look at Tobermory and realise, hey, you know, we could take some uh, Isla malt here and make a nice peated and call it Lechik. We could have Tobermory yeah. as a peated. And then eventually you went and did the exact same, and super interesting over at Bunahaven as well. Yeah, well, the the Bunahaven, the Bunahaven thing came, up, came about, um, um, Billy had been gone uh, by that time because... Burma Stewart had been acquired by the Trinidadian company, uh, CL um, Financial, and they had bought over the, the business, but they wanted to acquire uh, a, a brand and a, a more well-known um, product. And Burma Haven was on the market, as was, was Glen Goyne, you know, and, and obviously my eyes lit up when I, I thought, because at that time, the owners, uh, the um, Robertson and Baxter, who are part of the Edgington Group, they wanted they try, but they were trying to originally sell the two distilleries together as one package. And I thought, God, this would be amazing to be able to go back to Glengoyne again and have that back under. But um, it became quite clear that um, that um, for for the the, the way the, the the business were looking at it, they thought that. It was too close to to Deanston. The Glen Goyne and Deanston were quite close together, and they wanted something further away, and they wanted something in a different region. And so um, the Bonnerhaven one, we managed to talk to them, and uh, at that time, um, Ian McLeod became interested in buying over uh, Glen Goyne, and and we became more interested. And so the talks became, and we had lots of meetings and such and we went went over and uh, I mean obviously a company like Robertson Baxter had spent money on uh, Bunnahaven but you know at the end of the day Bunnahaven will never be an attractive looking distillery it's a pretty ugly I, I, I call Bunnahaven beautifully ugly yes <laughs> it, it's true I mean it's like a big it's like a big prison you know, if you saw that from a boat, you were going past. You think it was a it was a local prison on Isla, um, just because of the shape of the buildings. But it's what's inside there, and 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 the the warehouses there are wonderful. These old warehouses that when we took it over in two thousand and three, and I had some wonderful times there. I mean, the 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 good thing about Bunnahaven was that the the kit and everything was in a pretty good con condition, but the the neglect about there was a number of things that were they've been neglected, but they had they had recently installed a very expensive discharge system into the into the the uh, the sound of Isla where all the pot ale went um, into the sea, which was great, and that was a very costly. I think that cost a couple of million to put in. So when we had bought that, that had just recently been installed, so that was something we didn't need to worry about. That was all approved by the environmental um, agency. And so um, what we just had to, I just had to look at the production. But the other neglect was that they had only ever, they only ever sold one a as a 12 year old. Occasionally yeah. they would bring out a limited bottling. Uh, and in those days, the, the Fesh Yule Festival had only been going a couple of years. And so they brought out a couple of limited edition bottlings for that. So we come in there and, and I looked at all the stocks and I, I, and a lot of the stocks that we had purchased back as part of it, some of the whiskies were fantastic. They were a great age. And, and then I brought out a, an 18-year-old and a 25-year-old. But my, my first releases um, 
were all were, it had to be bottled at 40 percent which i was not happy about but um we continually we bottled that the, the products were very 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 good but um it was 2009 and going into 2010 i eventually um convinced the 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 marketing team and the board that we should take all our products all the single malts from the three distilleries everything to unchill filter and i did tastings for them and i did the, a comparison across them yeah uh, the, even the ones that weren't that good at tasting the whiskies and that could, could notice there was a a big difference between them well and, let's, uh, just, let's let's just i think we need to dwell on this for a second i think it's important to our community here mm -hmm. i'm going to i'm going to draw out the discussion on on that process and I, I know some of your history in it and i think it's going to be interesting rob halford is chipping in and saying more deanston please neil cochran <laughs> is saying deanston 18 just gets better and better graham fraser is saying old deanston was not as highly regarded as a single malt as i recall jerry miller is saying that deanston 18 is one of my all-time favorites jumped in and bought it blind and loved it uh, Drew from Arizona is in. He's in late arrival and wondering if I missed if there's any story behind 46.3 from Ian. It's coming, Drew. You're in time. Don't worry. Jimmy yeah. Legacy, we call that. Moving to the boonies here. Absolutely. The boondocks, the boonies. Graham Fraser is saying, good grief. <laughs> He's, obviously, I'm picking up a chat from a wee, a wee while ago. Let's see what I'm missing. Yeah. And he's asking, was the equipment from Deanston and Tobermory needing renewal after Burn Stewart, Stuart Stewart took over? I think that's what you've been touching on there. And Greg is Greg from France is saying, a, a bit nostalgic of those old NAS 7.5, 20-year-old at OBs, I have to say. So Greg's gone back in a time where he was first introduced to some of these older ones and thinking that he's got some nostalgia mixing. And so every time he recalls the memory of tasting them, they're probably getting better in, in his mind. Bern Marnik mm -hmm. is saying, uh, uh, great stuff. We'll catch up on the replay. Ben, so, so good so good to have you in, my friend. So good that you were able to drop by quickly. Ben Marnik works at a bottling plant. So it's, it's, uh, he knows, and we've had discussions about uh, the actual brutal process that chill filtration actually is. Jimmy Legg is saying, uh, I naively never think of distilleries as business. It makes them seem less than I want them to be, <laughs> which is places where magic happens. It's okay. It's somebody that's able to just sit back in an armchair, Jimmy, and enjoy the whiskey. If you want to think in that way, absolutely, I actively encourage it, and it's something I like to do myself. We should never be stripped of the magic. <laughs> it shouldn't just be the preserve of the marketing department. We can make our own magic and how... All these kind of things come together, Ian, the, the serendipity, this this magic, this bizarre thing that's happened for us to be able to make it in Scotland as well. Rican Haddock's up in Shetland is saying, lock me up and throw away the key. He's talking about the way <laughs> I think. Whiskey Raider is, is saying, uh, uh, lock me up in that prison, please. The Boone have in prison, of course. <laughs> and Helen is saying, beautifully ugly from the outside, but their whiskey is glorious for the most part. Mm -hmm. Dirty Dog is saying, is Boone have taken volunteer whiskey prisoners? Ryan is saying, Boone Haven is one of the most beautifully ugly distilleries I've ever seen. What a wonderful producer of whiskey. Um, and they, and Rican Haddix is saying, someone shake Ian's hand. Do you know what, Rican Haddix? I think that you're going to want to shake his hand a wee bit more because he's touched upon this internal dialogue he's had. He's not happy that he's been a having, he's precious been a having that he's happened upon. He's got these jewels there and that he's discovered in these prison warehouses. And he's been asked to put them out at 40%. When I went to Fischiel in 2010, eh, I had the privilege of the distillery manager gifting me a bottle of Boone Haven 12-year-old for my 40th. It was wonderful. It was in front of my friends and everything. This courtyard setting with all the music and the, uh, the, the spectacle of the festival happening. And he said, Roy, I've got a gift. for." I was blown away. I was so emotional. But it was this. It was this bottle. It was the... 40% yeah. one. And even yeah. back in 2010, I knew, and I've sipped it again tonight, this is light and floral even. And this yeah. could be any Speyside whiskey. Uh, if you put it in front of somebody and tell them it's a Speyside, they just say, aye, aye, okay, it's a, it's a Speyside. There's nothing that says particularly coastal to me. There's nothing that says anything particularly Isla to me. There's nothing. It was always quite a soft whiskey to me. And I think that that was because so much to my naive palate, certainly, um, my young palate, um, which is still very young now. But back then, it was just soft, and I didn't love it. And it made me stay away from it for a while until very shortly after that, I think 2011, 2012. I don't know when this happened exactly. It was, it was, it was, 
It was late 2010. Okay, later in that very year. Ian, you got yeah. your way. So the first thing yeah. I'm going to just straight out and ask you, you've already touched on it. Why would you chill filter? Why would you not chill filter? Is it either direction important to you and why? You know, chill filtration is a, it, it provides uh, only um, cosmetic uh, difference to uh, whiskey. It's there because uh, to avoid chill haze, you know, when people added ice or cold water to their whiskey, it would go slightly cloudy. Now, the way that I explained to people was that, you know, you should see that as a sign of authenticity, that if the whiskey is authentic, it should go cloudy because that means that you're getting you're getting the, the, the real thing. You know, if you get a whiskey that's been chill, chill filtered and you add water to it and add ice and it just stays the same, you know, you're getting this diluted product, you know, and, you, you know, there was, a, there was so many um, wonderful casks that I found at, at Vanahaven, and uh, I, I went on and on about it, you know, and eventually um, when we released, when we first brought out and we released everything, and one of your, uh, your team had asked about the 46.3, it just so happened that when, you know, when, when, when I was working on all these whiskies and trying to show them, um, and I was just adding, you know, the amount of water, just really just guessing it, but knowing a good deal you know, that I wasn't far away from 46. But so when I was doing it, it ended up that most of my samples all ended up at around about the 46.3. So I said, right, that's what we should, because that's where I was enjoying it. It's best that it was 46.3. And uh, that's why everything went to 46.3. I think there was a couple of the, the one of that I brought out that were um, when we first brought out uh, uh, a Tushuk one, I think it was bottled at 46, I think the first one, but then it went to 46, three as well, and everything was up. But I can remember when I first broached the idea with the marketing team and they were going, oh, no, no, we can't do anything. The consumer won't like it. And I just said, that, look, the consumer will like it more. And I'm trying to say to them, and, and I had to show them then. And I took them over. To the bottling hall. This is where you're one of one of the guys that you said was at, worked in the bottling hall. Ben, ben and Martin, Ronnie. They were, running, they were running through Bunnahaven at that stage, and they were filtering it. And I went in and I, I took out one of the sheets after they'd done the run, and we took out the sheet. And they, it was a very fine micron sheet, but you took it out and it was all oily and greasy. But that's what. And I said. And I rubbed it my, my hands on it and I said, smell that. And no, the smell would just have knocked you over. And I said, that's what I want to be kept in the whiskey. What's down there at that part of the filter was all the, the char, the bits of char out of the cask. I said, that's what I don't want in it. But I want all this oil, all this texture, which gives me all the aroma and the flavor that I was looking for. That's what That should be kept in the, the whiskey. We take that sheet out and then... We don't need to do it and we don't chill the, the whiskey down and so eventually they saw and we, they, they, they never looked back after that Roy. it was everything had to be you know and i was astounded when you told me that they had uh, brought out a version of deanston and bring it down to 40 percent again which in my eyes was absolutely crazy but that's one of the reasons i left uh, the, the the business was because of the south africans that took over that's a south african idea and it's just, it was just crazy. I kind of felt like if if they want to go chasing, you know, supermarket volumes or supermarket price point product, if there's profit there or volume to be had there, I understand that why they would want to do that and present something with a low barrier of entry alcohol-wise for new gateway whiskies for people. But don't do it with the Deanston name on there. Don't do it with the Deanston branding because we've come to love Deanston for that natural presentation for the fact that it's non-chill filtered. Let me ask you then, you've done that, you've taken your folk out to the bottling plant, you've shown them this aroma, these oils, these the, not not just the aroma and this flavour that you're talking about, but also that, that potential texture loss as well. Yeah. So were you yeah. then able to in one glass have a chill filtered yeah. and then in another glass have a non-chill filtered and then do yeah. a comparison? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and when I looked at it, you know, it's it's maybe not the story, the same thing for every 
every malt whisky is slightly different, and there are obviously people that that still think that their whisky is better at forty. So that's that's fine, and I'm totally in agreement with that. But the fact is that the whiskies I was working with, and the way that I saw it is, I put it down to around about thirty percent of texture, aroma, and flavour were being extracted okay. through chill fil filtration, and the I remember it was only they just well just after we we had launched it, I had a a, a get together with Dave Broom, and Dave came up to my lab at Deanston and I went through the same thing with him, giving him samples of, and he was so amazed at the the difference, the changes of the style of the whiskies that he wrote like a, as of a six or an eight page spread in the whiskey magazine doing a complete comparable comparable tasting, a vertical tasting of before and after. And he wrote, uh, you know, uh, very complimentary on that. And it's I have to say, look I looked for that article. I looked for it, uh, I, you know, I, not extensively, but I, I, I have tried to find that article. I think it might have only been in print at that time. I don't know if it was I'll a digital. I'll send it to you, Roy. Fantastic. Copy, I'll send it to you. Even a scan or something, a PDF. Yeah, yeah I'll that scan you can it send it That's no problem. I'll send it over to you. And then I can make it available to folk that are interested in, you know, people that follow the channel and things like that as well. Yep. Because here's the thing, Ian. Um, we've already established, we're talking about nostalgia a wee bit here and modern whiskey versus old whiskey. The malts were, they just inherited the practices that were put in place for blends. The Hollywood post-war boom of whiskey, having that shiny, clear uh on the rocks dram or whatever they might have you know scotch on the rocks whatever it was keeping it bright and, and sparkling keeping it consistent all of yeah. these things and yeah. malt came into the fray and they were treated the exact same way here's a fascinating yeah. story that i think is also an ian mcmillan story um all these whiskies are being treated the same way that blends always have been and the malts are brought in there and they're they're used to season uh these let's say season or or they're used in in conjunction with grain whiskey in order to build the blend whatever it may be and it's all just chill filtered it's all going to be watered down to 40 percent or maybe 43 for export and that's just the way it is it's treated ian mcmillan comes along this is, i think this is true and says great in order to keep the whiskey clear this cosmetic polishing that you're doing you don't need to chill filter your grain spirit. Mm -hmm. That's right. Is that true? That's true. That's what I done. Yeah, I insisted that only the only the malt uh, element of the blend, which was maybe only could maybe be thirty percent, or or uh, it could be it could be twenty percent or twenty five percent. That was all. You don't need to chill filter grain whiskey because I mean you're removing you know because it's a lighter white uh, whiskey. You're removing texture and flavour from from that. So if you just chill filter, because it's the malt whiskey, it's the it's the congeners, the esters, and that that's going to make it go uh, cloudy. But so you chill filter the malt, and I always thought that then that the blend itself benefited if you didn't chill filter the grain. So also, what, what we're going to move into there then is the realm of potentially mouthfeel and texture. Yeah. What we're talking about is it's more than just those aromas and things that you got when you rubbed your hands on that on that membrane, that, that sheet. We're talking about, we're talking about f uh, the oils, the, the fatty acids. We're talking about yeah. things that contribute to flavor and yes, and, and, and aroma, but also to texture and mouthfeel. Yeah. So you were able to even, even manipulate things to bump up the, the quality of even a blend by taking, taking that, 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 um, that approach. So then for you to come along and do the exact same thing to malts and by hammer blow demonstration, show them comparison, bringing along Dave Broom, getting Dave Broom involved. And that's, these are modern concepts and truth. The old yeah. traditional way of handling malt, you know, I don't want, it's, it's too rude to say it was to abuse it, but it was to strip it. It was to strip it out for the sake of a cosmetic thing. I think that I'm a bit of a romantic. I'm a malt enthusiast. It's what I'm all about. I make no bones about it. I think that's an amazing thing that nowadays 
we we view this thing as being it's okay for it to have batch inconsistency it's okay for it to vary over bottlings or years or batches whatever it may be and it's okay for it to be we get take it out of the boot of the car and it's cloudy in the bottle <laughs> you know it's been on a cold shelf so it goes cloudy we just leave it at room temperature for a while and it's fine again if we yes, put, it, put it over ice if we put a bit of cool water in it it clouds all of that is okay because we know, as you say, it's a mark of authenticity and that it's not had anything taken out of it. That's right. You know, I, I think oh, people should come complain, Roy, if they get a single malt and you add water to it on ice and it doesn't go, it doesn't go cloudy. Then you say, oh, there's something wrong with this whiskey. What's, why have they, why is this been chill filtered? Why did they have to chill filter it? So what's the relationship with 40 six or 45.7 percent abv then why is that well, the benchmark the the esters the fatty esters remain in solution at that alcoholic strength and it's when they it's when they go below 46 that they fall out of solution and that's when they can cause chill haze but if it's above 46 but rem, remember 46 if you still add water to that you're going to bring it down below 46 and it'll go uh, slightly cloudier then you know so you're always going to get um, so the the higher, if you're into a, a cast strength whiskey at 55, 57, and you add some some water to that, but you don't get below the 46 threshold, then it won't go cloudy, you know. So it's only that's and, when they. So these when these whiskeys, then we can consider that they are more stable. Then yeah. they're more stable if they're if they're uh, transported, bottled, um, sold at, at 46 percent, 45.7 or above. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the reason that they that they bottled uh, uh, whiskies in coloured uh, glass because when it was in a cold country, you couldn't see if it was cloudy or not. I mean, that was that was really the reason, um, <laughs> and, and that's why it's, it, it was in coloured uh, glass. <laughs> that's that's fascinating in itself just to hear that. Bill Monteith has bought me a dram to say cheers, Roy and Ian, and here's to my new favourite number. 46.3, <laughs> putting it on the back of my new jersey. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Legs bought me a dram as well. I said, I'd, I'd like to know what the rules are. For, <laughs> yeah, cheers. I'd like to know what the rules are for calling something non-chill filtered. What is the temperature cut off? What is the kind uh, number of filters? I've had non-chill filtered whiskies barely cloud. Well, well, there's there's that, isn't there? There's that thing where it, where it, it, it doesn't always cloud. And also the fact, Jimmy, that we don't, it doesn't need to be 45.7 or higher to go out in a bottle unchill filtered. Gl uh, Glendronach, famously, 43% presentation says unchill filtered on the label. It's almost like they're saying, oh, it's going to be cloudy. We don't care. We're going to put it out there. 12 years old, unchill filtered, 43%. And it's that because they know that the higher ABV starts to add or starts to heighten that barrier to enjoyment for somebody coming into the, the category as a newbie, I think. So we don't need to chill filter under 45.7, but that's why we do it, I think, as you've said. No, no, no you, you do it just to, uh, I mean, obviously, if a chill filter could be done at any sort of strength, I mean, the, there's a, the different temperatures. I mean, for me to keep more in, like we're going back to the blend here, but I was uh, chill filtering the malt, I actually turned the chill uh, up. I wanted it then, we'd go through the chill filtration, but it would be either at zero or one degree uh, Celsius rather than um, minus one or minus two, which a lot of chill filtration is done at. So it's just so a less if, aggressive filtration. Yeah, if you did it that little bit warmer, then the, I, I think you were getting more more through as as, as, as well. But uh, as I and, and the same as I insisted when I when I went to Bladnock and I evaluated all the stock and brought out the, the expressions from Bladnock and I managed to buy a lot of stock back from the, the previous owners and companies that previously filled uh, Bladnock and I recast virtually everything into good quality wood. And the, the the strength that I was working on in the lab turned out to be 46.7 there. So everything at Bladnock was bottled at 46.7. Uh, that's but, you answered the question I was going to ask you because we're going to obviously move on to Bladnock for a couple of minutes too. Yeah, but to yeah. get back to Jimmy's question there and what he's talking about there, are we just then talking about a, a variation when it comes to filtration? And this is fascinating for me as a malt fan. Are yeah. we talking about if, if, if it's zero, we've got one per, a softer version is, is one degree or so. 
and then more aggressive is how many degrees below zero you go. Are there any other variables that is kind of uh, how well, fine the mesh the is? Or it's the mesh. It's the thickness. It's the micron, uh, the size of the micron of the filters of the mesh filters, you know, and how fine that you want to make that. I mean, the finer you 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 make it, the less you'll it'll get through. The less of the fattier um, esters will get through. So you, mm -hmm. I, um, when they were when they were forcing it through, you know, um, you you get this thinner product at the end and all yeah. the goodness. I mean, I used to always say, Roy, you know, it's taken uh, it's taken twelve years to get to this stage. Why the hell are you taking thirty percent of it out? You know, if it's taken all that time to Absolutely. get to this wonderful stage, and then you're 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 shortchanging the consumer by by uh, chill filtering it. But and I think the the argument here is Ian that if malt whiskey hadn't fallen into the furrow that blends had created, I mean blends created the market. There's no doubt we've got a lot to thank for the amazing yeah. success that Scotch whiskey as a general category is. And I don't want to knock blends. I have blends here. I enjoy blends regularly. I love yeah, yeah, Scotch whiskey. But if malt hadn't fallen into that furrow and just followed into the same kind of been handled in the same way that legacy that blends had given them. Maybe somebody will, would have looked at malt whiskey and said, "No, this is a this is a different product. This isn't the same as grain. It's distilled from different ingredients in a different way. This is a different whiskey. This is a different product. We need to treat this a wee bit better." And they wouldn't then be stripping things out of it. I think. I think they would have maybe, if they'd looked at it as a as an individual product back in the day, they may not have looked at it through the same lens as the way they looked at blends. I think. And but my. My, yeah, my idea yeah. is to be a bit more precious about malt. Let them have the consistency with blends. Yeah. Let them put it out 40%. Let them chill filter it. We know what that market is is needs. But when it comes yeah. to malt, we need to be precious about the malt. Remember the uh, the original blends, Roy, weren't chill filtered. It was only when the, um, they went to the American market um, that they started to get com complaints about the – because the – popular way of drinking uh, was to put ice and, and everything into your drink and it became and there was this fear and so that put a real fear through the the the, the scotch and the irish uh, whiskey companies then and and that was introduced in the in the the i think it was the early 70s that chill filtration came came in but blends before that uh, were not chilled down they went through a, a, a filtration process before bottling, but they were never chilled down, and and yeah, and even finer, even finer micron screens were intro introduced. So, <clears throat> chill filtration was a, a way of uh, it was introduced because they didn't want to get complaints of whiskey going 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 cloudy when it was on a cold shelf. Even though people were told that some people would keep their whiskey in the fridge because that's the way. And when they took it out, they're going, "Oh God, there's something wrong with this," you know. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the reason that chill filtration came about. And it's like you said, when malts became popular, they thought, "Well, we, this is the way that we do it." You know, we we have to follow the same procedure here. We've been doing it since the last few years, and no com no complaints. And so we have to do the same with malt. And it was just learning that people began to learn. And I think a lot of that came down to the the independent people being able to bring out versions of cask bottlings, um, which brought the consumer and said, well, wait a minute, this is a different animal altogether. You were looking at the statutory bottling uh, from the distillery, and then you were getting uh, companies that were acquiring single casks and such, and they were bottling at cask strength or they might be bought, they might take it down slightly, but it was never um, down a, a chill filter. They didn't have the equipment to, to chill filter either. So it came as it was. And then that it became the, the actual larger companies became aware. I mean, Burn Stewart were not, in 2010, were not the first company to introduce a uh, non chill filter uh, on that scale. Sure. But we were the first company in Scotland to take our entire range of single malts from three distilleries. Uh, and if you counted Tobermory and Lechig as two, that was four different four uh, brands. Yep. And they were all became chill filtered. Some companies would chill filter some stuff and then they would they would be unchill filtered for other stuff, you know. So they would never take the 
the the step to unchill filter everything but we did amazing and it is and i think that especially when you talk about that kind of post hollywood um, or sorry, that post-war Hollywood boom that I was talking about there, where people are enjoying Scotch and the Rocks and they want it to stay clear and things like that. The, 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 the consumers drove that happening. It was consumer feedback. Yeah. Conversely, yeah. Here, we, here we are today. Tell me, what motivated Ian McMillan then? Is it because you got uh, hands-on and you were able to touch that filter, you were able to see the oils and everything that was getting stripped, or was there a bit of consumer push happening there as well? Because by the time the 2000s come along and you're active and you're in the lab there with Dave Broom and things, the internet is here. We're all becoming much more knowledgeable about the products and you know, about the manufacture, the, how they're handled and things, how they're being received. Was there any kind of, is there any point in us banging on like this as we do as enthusiasts with our wee YouTube channels and things? Is there any point, do you think that there, that there is an ear there in the industry that's listened to this? Yeah, I mean, nowadays, because I can, the thing that brought it more to light when, when I tried to explain it more was when I used to be asked to do tasting notes for all the different um, expressions, limited editions, whatever, of all the single malts, I would always do them at, you know, um, before it was bottled. You know, yeah. so I was, I was getting it at the way that I liked it, and it was always around that 46%, and I was doing my tasting at that. And then we're getting some people, I mean, okay, tasting notes are, are individual, and not everybody gets the same uh, perception of aroma, flavor, texture from the, from the, each product. But some were saying, how are you getting all these things when I'm not really picking this up at all? And you had a few of these things, and that's what I tried to highlight as well by saying, well, look, the consumer do know us. They do see it. You know, this is what I'm uh, giving them as an indication of what I've got here. But I've been doing, and I do all my tasting notes of uh, from the vatting before it's bottled, and and that was the difference. I never done it from the actual bottle itself. All right. Let let me tell you. Let me tell you. The consumers notice. And it's not just because it's in a different shape bottle with a different brand. Absolutely. This and this, oh. and every measurable metric, is a completely different animal. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that this was this is a drive past never to be replaced. This is no. never not in my cabinet. This, no, I, I do reviews on the channel called Recycled Reviews. I know that you've not seen a mean, but. It's literally me standing at my wheelie bin with 15 empty bottles and I'm reviewing the whiskey because the bottle's empty. So I've got to know the whiskey from the neck pour down to the last dram. And I feel that I'm able to decide at that point whether I'll replace it again. This is never not in my cabinet. <laughs> okay. This has taken me 10 years to get through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a completely different thing. And I know that there's more into it than that. There's, this was not made in the same way you made changes to production. I know that it wasn't yeah. matured in the same way you invested and you had the access to more money to invest in better casks. Yes. But then you also won the argument, why go to all that effort of producing it? Why mature it in the best of casks and all the investment and the building and everything, and then take it along to a bottling hall and strip out 30%. I think that's a takeaway from tonight. That's amazing. Graham Young yeah. has brought me a dram to say, we say, oh, thank you, Ian McMillan. Where you go, great whiskey follows. Uh, the, this journey uh, with this genius is just amazing. Thank you for your impact and your craft. Graham Young, thank you very much for the nice words and thank you very much for the for the dram as well. And also uh, from my friend Tom, if I can catch his, he's bought us a dram as well. What an interesting and enthusiastic guest. It's great to see you with a fellow evangelist. <laughs> Absolutely, Tom. Thank you so much. And Benny Fries has bought me a dram as well to say knowledge, wisdom, craft, excellent evangelism. I love it. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Roy. Thank you all, boys. Thank you so much for your, for your generous drams and your kind words for Ian as well. Cheers. Cheers. What's in your glass, Ian, as I pour something else? This is a uh, Tobermory, a uh, fifteen-year-old, um, which I I uh, brought out. Um, this was um, when I first went over to Spain uh, uh, through a contact um, with Gonzalez Gonzalez Bias, and uh, 
um, a wonderful guy uh, called Brian Calder, who's, whose son Andy actually came and worked with uh, with Arne Stewart for a number of years as well. And then and, and he's now production or, or sales director rather at Loch Lomond Distillery. But his father was the, the main man in the UK for all the top uh, Gonzalez Bias products. And he, I met with him and we went over, it was an unforgettable trip over to Jerez and I got access to some of the finest Gonzalez Bias uh, sherry casks and shipped them back. And one of these ones I put Tobermory into and this was the, the product that came out of it. And this is one of my favorite uh, whiskies. This is one of the ones I, I think you, we spoke earlier, Roy, when you remember that it came in a lovely wooden box that was wrapped in a, a tissue paper with a, which if you, when you folded it out, it was a copy of a print that was uh, painted of Tober Mori with a lovely um, painted uh, colored houses on the front. Uh, it was a super product, but this is one of my favorites. You know, uh, if I'd known, if we weren't sitting here just before we went live, I yes, throw away all, yeah, the Tober Mori 15. I throw away all my packaging and all of it. I don't keep it. I would like the option not to have to buy packaging with the bottle if I didn't. You yep. know, it's, not, it's not important to me. I'm happy just with the bottle. However, through in my whiskey cabinet in the dining room, if I open the bottom drawer, there's a box there. And if I slide open that box with a wee cut out of mull in it, that tissue is yeah. still inside. And I'll give a wee shout out. I know he very occasionally watches, but he still does tune in from time to time. That was a gift from my friend Lloyd Conaghan, my neighbour, eh, back in the day. He, he gave that to me. He, he knew somebody that worked at Burns Stewart, and he, and he gave this as a gift, a birthday gift to me. And it was that Tobermory 15. And I said to yeah. you, before we went live tonight, I said, Ian, it was the first batch I got. There was some much, much older stuff in there, wasn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was uh, there was some twenty year old whiskey in here as well. I mean, this was this was one of the one of the best uh, Tubermores that was ever ever bottled. You know, I, I've not tasted anything that has beaten this yet. I know there was a couple of bottlings that we did after it, but the first one was the was the best. I remember, I remember that kind of almost like flat Coca-Cola, cherry cola thing that was going on. I remember the books, the leather-bound books and the dustiness, yeah. the fustiness that was in it. Um, I remember the kind of really kind of dark, bitter chocolate thing. That's right. I, rem I, rem I remember all of those things about that whiskey. And there was an odd oiliness or an industrial or a... I, I'm going from memory now. There was something in it that gave away the fact that what we were talking about here was an old-school-style whiskey. Um, yeah. That was what that that whiskey played like to me. It was super characterful. It was, um, I actually that does appear on a recycled review. I do throw away that empty bottle in a recycled review. <laughs> yeah, maybe one of the early recycled reviews. Danny Cab da uh, Daniel Caballero has bought me a dram as well. Oh, I wonder what currency that is. But whatever it is, he's bought me thirty thousand of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Daniel, you have to remind me where you are as well. I think you're in Colombia. So I know that that's what it is. Thank you, my friend. Ian McMillan is a personal hero of mine, says Daniel. He elevated <laughs> some of my current favourite single malts. Greetings from, uh, uh, yes, Daniel Caballero in Colombia. Daniel, thank you very much, my friend. And uh, thank you for your nice words for Ian as well. Cheers, Daniel. Cheers. Mm. Wow. So what's just happened? I have not sipped this whiskey. This has been open and I poured off this so far because I put it in a bottle to send it up to you, Ian. Yeah. This is um the this is the I've opened the this is the ten year old Bladnuck. Well we'll, we'll call this we'll call this the Ian McMillan one. Because yeah. obviously now um all the stocks and re-racking, everything that you did, the refurbishment refurbishment down at Bladnuck. Um, it's still in good hands. It's still being looked after down there. Nick Savage is now in place there, and I think he's since released this 11-year-old. And I, I couldn't get the 10-year-old. I bought the 11-year-old instead, and I've since been able to get the 10-year-old. Um, and that's what I'm sipping now. The first time I took a sip of that is there, and I forgot what I was drinking because I just poured it there. And to raise a glass to Daniel there, I, I forgot, and it caught me immediately. Um this is a completely different animal. If I'm if I'm open, it you don't mind me speaking frankly about Bladnick. It was always one of those kind of romantic little underdog distilleries. You really wanted it to come on and do well, and occasionally they would bring along a product like this. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely yeah. stunning whiskey. But this is cast strength from a sherry cask. Absolutely. Yeah. 
dreamy whiskey. This is this actually belongs a friend of mine. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, buddy. Um, uh -huh. I promise I won't drink too much of it before it gets back to you. <laughs> but this is interestingly a ten-year-old. And the other bottle here is interestingly just out of pure coincidence, an eleven-year-old. I'll let that try yeah. and focus on that. This is an eleven-year-old yeah. as well, Bladnick. Now, yeah. the trouble with Bladnick was, is that. For every bottle that you got that was wonderful and exceptional and floral and creamy and lovely, there was another one that you just wondered why it ever got into a whiskey bottle. I've got yeah. some here that I'll drink them. They're not bad. They're not especially bad whiskeys, but they're maybe just a bit odd or bland or just plain average. Um, somebody else has bought me a drama. Just I don't want to miss that. Oh, no, sorry, as it's Daniels. I did catch it. Sorry. So, I mean, Bladnick was, to me, one of those kind of ideas that, maybe like whiskies of the olden days with the peaks and the troughs. It was a perfect example of that volatility. And I think that the reason I didn't connect with Bladnick until very, very recently, if I'm honest, I knew you were behind the, the refurbishment there. I knew that it was you that was doing the things down there. But it was the price that it first came out at when it hit the market. Yeah. It wasn't until you start to – the people that you trust, people that you like to hear their opinion about whiskies. They're saying, Roy, don't drink Bladnick 10 and treat it as a 10-year-old. Treat it as a 50-pound bottle of whiskey. That's the way you need to look at it and, and approach it in that way. Maybe some, maybe somebody has saw my reaction as I as it registered with me. This is a this is a completely different animal at first approach. We can see that this is not just a different shaped bottle, but we can see that it says unchill filtered on the label. We're starting to see the DNA of Ian, right? Uh, we yeah. can see the age statement up front. 46.7% as you've pointed out. Was it, was Did you go through the same challenges to speak to the owners at Bladnick as you did at Burn Stewart or was it different? No, it, well, it wasn't. It was quite It was quite um, an easy conversation. Uh, when I spoke to the owner, he was a, he's an Australian uh, guy who likes his whiskey and he always wanted to be involved in the Scotch whiskey industry. And when I first met David and we spoke about it and I took on the role about refurbishing the still but also to evaluate all the stock and to bring in more stock. And then we looked at what was available um, and I I said, said, suggested, because when we looked at different whiskies from Bladnock and we'd, we'd done some, some tastings and I'd taken some cast samples and shown them what it was like as, as an unchilled filtered whiskey, I says the way that we we must start here is as unchill filtered, and we we remain there. We we don't do anything that is chill filtered. And he bought onto that. He was very very he, he was very supportive, and and everything that we brought out at Ladner. I mean, there was some casks. I mean, honestly, when when I was evaluating it, I I don't mind telling there was a number of casks that I had to apply for. Uh, uh, to destroy them because the whiskey was so bad, and they were the the ends were kicked in there, and the duty was was written off by customs and excise because the product was so bad. You um, can't even blend it out; it's so bad. I couldn't do anything anything with it at all. I mean, I I couldn't. I mean, it was just awful. But you know, I there was a lot of some nice. There there always is a little ray of of sunshine in in some of the casts that you find. And I found some really lovely ones. You know, unfortunately, I found this in this old, uh, this older, the oldest uh, that we had at that time uh, um, was, uh, it, was about 20, it was about 27, 28 years old at that time. And uh, I, I looked at this whiskey, but I thought it had gone a little bit flat. So I said, right, there was two hogsheads of it, and I took it out of that. And put it into back into a Moscatel cask, uh, the two of them take together into one cask to give it that little bit of lift. I love what Moscatel does; it introduces that sort of sweetness and a little bit of body into it as well. It's a lovely. I love the freshness of of the of Moscatel, uh, this sort of very sweet sherry. And uh, so we put it in that, and that's what we chose to uh, when Blackdog was um, two hundred years old. They wanted something very special, and that's that's the oldest whiskey that we had. Although I did manage to acquire some whiskey after that, um, which was very rare—a a small amount. I managed to get some 
uh, whiskey that was distilled at Bladnock in 1966, which was 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 very old. Yeah, uh, and uh, they they haven't done it with that yet, but it's because the strength had dropped down to I think it was 40.7. I took it out and it's now in a a static uh, con container now until they decide what to do it. But the 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 uh, the the old uh, Moscatel one um, was uh, it was it was 1980 1988 yes it was and uh, and the distillery was 200 years old in 2017 and so that whiskey was then 29 years old and we bottled it then but we only bottled 200 bottles of it and they, they put it into a very expensive bottle I mean the bottle was I remember. Really Oh, so it was so expensive as well. Uh, yeah. It's a lovely packaging, beautiful leather box, and uh, a lovely gold. And it was a fantastic bottle. The uh, whiskey's uh, really, really nice as well. So it's very unusual, Bladnock, but it's not everybody's going to go out and spend five thousand pounds on a bottle of. No, oh, and I noticed your language there and your body language a wee bit distancing yourself from that because obviously it's not it's not the kind of whiskey that we can connect with or touch. Um, well, well, it wasn't my. I mean, I always thought, to to, to be honest, that when you were talking about the price of Bladnock, I thought it was always over overpriced. I thought it was expensive, but it it was quite limited the volumes that we had, and so you were really paying for the the sort of uh, the lack of volume that we that we had of it. I, I um, mean, it's a huge factor. I think is scarcity and demand and 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 things and. And I have to say, Bladnock, when they when they stepped out again, and they wanted to immediately premiumize or at least step up everything. They wanted to shake off that image of the past and say, "No, we're about this in the future." I'm thinking of Samsara's and Adela's and the Seventeen yeah. and all these other ones. They were all yeah. salty when it came to price. Yeah, um, and it, that was probably what isolated me in the early days. But I have to be honest now. I've had two or three sips of this as you're chatting away, and I have. It's, there's a, a disservice to my community because I made the mistake with Glen Turret recently as well, honestly speaking, is that when you look at it, you say it's too bloody expensive, but it's because you're judging it through the lens of an age statement. Yeah. Not every 12-year-old whiskey is going to taste or be the same as every other 12-year-old whiskey. There's right. lots and lots of things going on there, and you have to taste it, especially taste it blind, taste it in contrast with other things, judge it against its peers based on price point. This is going to be an interesting experiment for me going forward because this 10-year-old is not behaving like a 10-year-old in a glass. This is a lovely, rich, and I'm tasting lots of things in here. There's deep, ripe fruit here. I'm tasting, you know, fermentation in here. There's things happening in here that I can clearly see that is, that this is a serious whiskey presented in a serious way. I'm going to enjoy exploring this and taking my time with this. I was already excited by the 11-year-old Again, it's probably a very similar thing, just that maybe a year older. Um, it's yeah, slightly exactly. darker, it's just a notch darker, I think, the 11 year old. Um, but, you know, this is the 11 year old was 60 pounds, it's, it's expensive. The 10 year old was 50 pounds, still expensive if you look at the age statement. But based on the glass that I'm enjoying now, when this is finished, I think I'm quite excited and I'm at the point that I, I can foresee if I can get this. You know, it's not always going to be available. As you say, it's in limited supply. Um, I may uh, absolutely replace this. This is a cracking whiskey. So it's interesting yeah. there that what you're talking about there is not just the production. You know, you've inherited whiskey at this point. You're not you're not at Burn Stewart days where you're able to build with the blocks that you've laid down. You've got inherited whiskey. Yeah. So the first thing that you've had to do is go in there, refurbish a distillery, <laughs> but also sample every single cask that you've got on hand and work out what you're going to keep, what you're going to re-rack, what, what you're going to do with. But what we've got here is however you want to judge it, whether you don't like the square bottles of Bladnock, whether you don't like the new expensive prices, we've got a new thing and we've got a new proposition here, something that is a legacy, something that's going to go forward as a much more reliable product. And I think that if I could summarize this that concept of nostalgia, modern whiskey, with minds like yourself making malt whiskey for the sake of selling and enjoying and sharing as malt whiskey at some point in the future, 
If we look at it, if we frame it in that way and look at what we have today versus the volatility and the peaks and the troughs, and sometimes the troughs could get deep. As you say, to the point the trough is so deep that you're writing them off. You can't even blend them out. You can't use this whiskey and they're destroyed and written off. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. have to imagine, Ian, that in the time from today on forward, that type of thing almost never, ever happens. No, 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 it won't happen now. No, I mean, these were, I mean, a, a lot, I mean, the, the cask management going back all the years that go, we go back in years again was was not good. I mean, in the early days of me going to, I remember in Burn Stewart, I mean, I was quite a, a shocked at the quality of casks that they were filling in those days when they when they just brought, when they were just, I bought Deanston and the casks that I got in, I said, these are absolute rubbish. I mean, they had been filled. God knows how many times they'd been filled. There was no way of tracing back how the 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 history of that cask, you know, and that's where I got into, you know, the big thing is before any cask was filled of anything I've made, I knows the casks myself. I and I taught people what to look for, you know. I mean it's the it's the one thing that I always tell people in, in whiskey is the one thing I can never do to anybody I can never teach somebody to smell or to taste, you know. You either have that avail ability yeah. or not. And we all have our own perception of aroma and and taste. So um but to pick out um off off notes in empty casks before you you're filling, you know, it's like a it's the old saying, you know, if you if you use I mean it's as good as what you put into the the cask. And the old saying is you can't make honey out of shit. You know? <laughs> 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 that, is, that is the thing, you know. Or, or as we've, or as we've explored in Avipa previously, you can't polish a turd, right? It's just, <laughs> you know, a, a cask is is going to uh, is going to enhance something, but it can't fix oh. something that's broken, right? It won't. Be, the chat here, and it's fascinating. Neil Cochran is saying he's asking a question here that I'm going to actually ask you. It's an, an interesting yeah. one. And uh, Tom Scaramuzza is saying, "I miss my Blandic Ten so much. What a wonderful bottle." Whiskey Radar saying is that October Mori 15 is really great. It reminded me of Yamazaki 18 Sherry Cask. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a, that's an interesting um, yeah. comparison there. Neil Cochran has asked if you know the story behind, um, and I grabbed some other Deanstons here as well. Now, th this was after, I think this was after you left. Did you have a hand in the Palo Cortado casks at Deanston? It was me that bought these casks. Oh, um, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> This is this only produced just a little under 500 bottles, and I'm sorry to everyone that I'm showing this to, but this is my, one of my all-time all-time favourite Deanstons. I don't usually like a sherry, a sweet sherry. I do, sorry, that's wrong. I do like it. I like it a lot, but it's not always my preference. I'm, I'm much more lean towards a bourbon, ex-bourbon cask, refill casks. However, this was amazing. One sip, it's sweet and syrupy. The next sip, it's savoury and, and funky, and there's there's just everything going on with this. And I bought maybe three or four bottles at the time that this was available at a distillery, and I went up yeah. to buy more because I was started to gift them. It wasn't cheap. It was a wee bit pricey. And I went up to get more, and it was gone. And then one day I was visiting with a friend of mine from the States, Dwayne. Dwayne and I went up to Deanston, and there was just maybe a dozen bottles sitting on the shelf. It was almost like a gift from the whiskey gods. <laughs> and I bought another two bottles of it. And I've got this, and I've got one more intact bottle. And I'm so precious. So Neil Cochran wants to know the story behind the Palo Cortado casks. I think he well, suggested the really? story behind it. Well, Palo Cortado, I mean, when I went, it was one of my trips out in Spain. And, you know, Palo Cortado is not a cask that are, um, it's not a style of sherry that's made very often. It's like an, it's like an oxidized um, phenol. It's, it's like accidental it's, it's, sherry that's that's produced by accident. Well, if I, like, if I translate the Spanish, so a, a palo, palo in this context, cortado would be cut. Palo is a cut stick. So the way I yeah. understand it is they mark it with a chalk line, like the stick mark. That's right. Yeah. And and, and if if the oxidization fails, the the phenol doesn't exist anymore. What That's we right. have is they put a score through it and it becomes cut stick and we have a Palo Cortado cask. Yeah, absolutely. Because, and the, the fact is that it's, it's when the floor that's on top of the phenol, which keeps the uh, the, uh, the phenol um, um, 
from oxidizing. And what yeah. happens is when that splits um, and oxygen gets to the wine, then it, uh, it, it colors it as, as well, obviously, oxygen. Oxygen is a great thing. I mean, it, it's a savior, but it's also a, a horrible thing with it because it, it kills as well as gives gives life. And uh, But Polo Cortado, and good Polo Cortado is not made uh, all the time. You know, it's and, and it's not... And it's it's varying qualities, you know, and it, de it depends what quality the fino was and such at the time, and uh, uh, and I always wanted to 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 try that. And there's not a huge amount of Polo Cortado casks available, and I brought these back because I always thought that Deanston would do well in a cask because it's the type of spirit, you know, the the way that Deanston is. I I got to know really the feel of it and what cask it performs. It's not the best cask. It's not the best whiskey going into a sherry, a heavy sherry cask. I don't think Deanston is is that brilliant in Oloroso um, at all. Um, I it's not my favourite of it. You know, some people may well like it. And I remember I brought out a very old Deanston from 1974, and it was in a sherry cask. It was a nice whiskey, but it wasn't my favourite style of Deanston. And I think Deanston's more suited to the um, like the lighter sherry, but definitely his best is is ex bourbon casks. Definitely. Absolutely, I think that's why. And I think there is some sherry in the twelve year old, isn't there? But but it's light. It's refill sherry that they're using in the twelve. Or is it mostly bourbon? It's well, when I was, it was all bourbon for me. All bourbon. There was no sherry in it at all. Excellent. Certainly, any if there is sherry, it's not overt. It's very like that. Um, the yeah. Deanston 18 year old as well is is obviously exclusively bourbon, and I think it shines. And one of the one of the things that I love, it's not an easy one to recommend, Ian, but is the organic, the 15 organic as well. So yeah. clean, so spirit driven. So yeah. it's, it's like that snapshot at 15 years old where the cask has had such a light footprint. You're able to just yeah. really connect with a mature Deanston spirit with the lightest amount of cask involvement whatsoever. And you get all that amazing texture and that lovely peppery spice on the finish. The malt is heavy as well. And I think yeah. that why, why I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend uh, Deanston Organic to a lot of people is that when you're coming into whiskey, I think you're looking for big, bold hooks and flavors. And I think it takes you a wee while to, to appreciate the more subtle things like the spirit and the texture and the and things like that that's apparent in those. Christopher Malloy's bought me a drama. I don't want to miss that. Christopher, he's saying, where X rye used by the Scotch industry in the olden days. So going on from the Palo Cortado. So there isn't a there isn't a story behind that other than the fact that you purchased these. And the reason that we're able to enjoy these, were, were there quite a lot of them? Is there likely to be more of this available in the future? No, there, I, know there, there. I don't know if they continued to, to buy the small amount or it was just a uh, a one-off purchase that I bought in those days. Um, I did bring in other Pueblo Cortado, and I know that I filled some uh, some Bonahaven with Pueblo Cortado as well. I don't know what's become yes, of that. Did. Well, no, everybody went bonkers for it, and it sold out. Oh, did and, it, right? I remember talking to uh, American friends of mine, Scotch Test Dummies. They have another channel over in the States. We did a wee tour of Scotland. We took them with Bonahaven, and they fell in love. They didn't want to leave. So talk about ugly distillery as much as you want. I couldn't get those guys to leave that distillery that day. I had a whole itinerary for the rest of the afternoon. What we're going to we're going to go home and we're going to do all these things where we're going for lunch. And I remember them just saying, just sitting back in those big oversized deck chairs that they had at the time, and they're just saying, "Nah, we're happy here. We're not going <laughs> to. We're just going to hang out." And we went into this distillery shop, and they had because there were two that I remember two Palo Cortado been having releases. A younger one and a much older one. And Scott had had enough drams in him. He, the, the, wine, the Warehouse 9 tasting that he did, he'd had enough yeah. drams. He was going to, he was going to, if he could get the older Palo Cortado, he was going to just buy it. And he saw it there behind the glass cabinet and he said, sorry, it's just an empty box. It's gone. And he was destroyed. <laughs> but what he did do is he, is he, is he took one of my Deanston Palo Cortados home with him. Mm -hmm. And he loves it and he rips about it as well. My friend Dwayne, I took to Deanston that day where I found the ones that had, had damaged labeling or something. They had to go off and get relabeled and come back, which is why this gift happened where I found these there. Um, Dwayne is a peat head. He loves Isla whiskies, powerful, phenolic Isla whiskies. And he bought this Palo Cortado and took it home and messaged me to say, Roy, it's 
blended. It's lovely. So yes, I'm very grateful that you did uh, have the courage to put Deanston into the, those Palo Cortado casks. And I hope uh, that whoever's in charge of doing things in terms of cask sourcing and things down there are able to get their hands on some more of that because it was a terrific whiskey. But going back to Christopher Malloy's question, rye casks, any intelligence? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, rye. I mean, historically, rye was used in Scotland and in Ireland uh, as part of. I mean, whatever grain was in the the very old styles of making uh, whiskey, rye was part of it. But bringing rye casks in, yes, there there, there have been uh, rye casks used uh, a number of times in Scotland, you know, and uh, um, it has. I mean, I there I, I did this, uh, several experiments with rye as well. Um, and uh, they were they were really nice. I don't know whatever happened to them. You know, I I'm sure I filled uh, into rye casks as well. I I filled Tobermory into rye, um, but uh, you know they may well have. You know the the politics of the business then were some of the people that came on board uh, once the South, once the South Africans took over and the people that were knowledgeable in the commercial side of the business all left uh, Burn Stewart where there was a mass exodus once the South African company took over, uh, these casks were probably sold off to people for blending or whatever. I don't know. They, may be, they were maybe used in blending because they wouldn't have been at a mature stage to be used as a single malt. And if they're not trackable now, that's what's probably happened to them because there was too many people that came into the business that didn't have a clue about what they were doing. And uh, a lot of very good quality casks that I had filled got sold off. I, and I know that from people that, that um, were continued to work there after I left and then they subsequently left as well. So it does, make, it does make me, it does make me a wee bit, uh, you know, selfishly <laughs> nervous when, when I hear uh, things like that, because I have come to, I mean, it's, it, it, you know, I, I openly declare that I've become a Deanston fanboy. We're talking about somebody who dismissed it in the past. Mm -hmm. Act, actively avoided it because of my experiences with it. Has come back on board to absolutely, absolutely ad adore, not just adore the, the distillate and the spirit, but adore um, the people I've got to know at Deanston, the distillery itself, the buildings, the place. Just standing at that wall and looking at this blackened building from the from obviously the maturation that goes on there is the place is, is yeah. covered and and black the lampposts are black the wall is black but standing next to that river teeth and looking at the place and thinking this shouldn't exist this is a cotton mill and yet it does <laughs> and it's functioning yeah. in a way that is punching way beyond its way i'm i'm suggesting to you ian that deanston 18 right now is as close to klein leash as you can get outside of klein leash yeah I, very naive at amateur palate, but I actively encourage people to take the Instant 18 and sip it alongside any Klein Leashes yep. of a similar age, of course, all other things being the same. And yeah, you will be able to, in contrast, detect differences, but you must appreciate how similar they are. I think it's amazing that we have the Instant, and I, and I hope that whatever changes have happened through the ownership, through the team there, that the blueprints, the little building blocks, whatever, the changes that you fought so hard for endure because Deanston has become a precious thing. And while it's as good as it is just now, there, there are going to be evangelists like me sharing it and talking about it. We do have to be careful. We're talking about modern Deanston. <laughs> yeah. So if you're talking about Deanston from the past, there is a difference. I'm not saying that it's black and white, but it's past bad, modern good, because we talk about the peaks and the troughs. It's volatile, it's going to be. But modern Deanston, anything from about 2000, 2002 until today, this uh, distillation, buy blind. Yeah. It's within your price range. If you think it's the profile that you're going to enjoy, you're going to have a good experience. Peter Morris is saying, this has been a fascinating VPUB, loving the sense of refining the current amazing experience of enhancing and improving what we perhaps take for granted these days. Thank God for Ian. So you've got a fan in Peter Morris as well. <laughs> Donald Pass Whiskey, Tim is saying, Deanston 2008, nine-year-old Bordeaux red wine cask was amazing. That was the cask strength Bordeaux red wine cask, which I think was one of yours as well. Um, 
so that originally came out in 2017 so oh well maybe that was it would have been the casks that i had bought as well i brought a lot of casks in you know that was after i mean that was two years after i had gone but you know it would have been in I had to be in the cask because I bought all these Bordeaux casks as well. Even even a finish, you're talking about a decent decent finish. Greg's whiskey yeah. here, he's great one yeah. indeed. I think he's talking about the Palo Cortado. Um, James McGoran, good to see you. James is saying the new 18 is seriously delicious. Corey Clark is saying, first time joining live tonight and it's been fascinating. Quite early on in my whiskey journey, but your content has really taught me much so quickly and is always entertaining. Corey, you're welcome to come back again, my friend. Nice to welcome you in here. Uh, Neil is saying, oh, just as the chat jumps, sorry, Neil, I'm going to try and catch. I don't want to miss that. Buna having Palo Cortado is beyond sublime. So you've got, Neil's a fan of the Palo Cortado experience right there. Hoyt is saying, wish Deanston would do the 18-year-old cognac finish again. I thought it was wonderful. Again, oh, yeah. this is all about the parcel of uh, casks that's yeah. available. Um, Graham Fraser is saying, there was a single cask uh, Palo Cortado in my warehouse for tour at Deanston in 2020. Oh, that's interesting. So that's just last year, Graham. So that's a wee tip that there might be some Palo Cortado still maturing out there. And the good thing is these casks aren't disposed of. They just become refill casks after that, right? After they've been yes. the, yes. the, again. So might need a wee bit more time. Uh, right. Uh, ben Demon Hunter is saying, uh, uh, saying nice, nice things about me, so I'll skip that. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for your nice words. Jimmy Legge is saying, it's so sad to hear that politics is stopping me from getting whiskey. Hopefully it won't always be the case, Jimmy. I know it's difficult for you, and I know it's frustrating, but what you have to do is the Mohammed in the Mountain thing. Jimmy Legg has to come to Scotland. That's what needs to happen, Jimmy. You, a Deanston fanboy, says Helen. She's saying, surely not. She's uh, She's been here long enough to know um, that I do tend to wax a wee bit lyrical about modern uh, Deanston. And Roland Whiskey Radar is saying, last year I bought a 2006 Fino cast Deanston. What a stunner. So Deanston also works beautifully without the Palo Cortado accident. Uh -huh. And he's putting accident in, uh, in quotation marks. <laughs> Absolutely. So Ian... I'm going to I'm going to wait till we finish chatting before I summarize and and before I, I I say something to you directly. Before we get there, I'm just going to ask you. We've managed to burn through the time like we always do. It's incredible, but this is the V Pub. You don't need to sit through adverts. Cut it up and listen to it on replay and junks. Don't worry about the time. It's a pub session. It's not YouTube. It's not fast, low attention span content. It's the pub. It's whiskey teaching us to slow down. I want to ask Ian, what are you doing now? Well, I'm involved in uh, a few projects now. The the most local one to me, which is very interesting, is uh, um, the new distillery going to be built uh, uh, on the outskirts of Stirling, uh, going to be called Wolf Craig. And, uh, you know, it's a great team that we're, in, we're, in, we're involved with uh, here. You know, I, I don't think I've ever been involved in a project where there are four uh, masters of the quay, um, <laughs> you know, which is the highest, the yeah, highest honor. Richard Patterson, yeah. right? Yeah, Richard's uh, part of the team. Uh, myself, um, uh, Alan Rutherford, who was the ex uh, director with Diageo, managing uh, yeah. production director with Diageo, and um, a good friend of mine, Ian Lockhead, who was uh, operations director with uh, Dewars. Right. So okay. we're all uh, masters of the quake and. Uh, you know, and the, the like chair of the... It's like the Whiskey Masters Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, and the chairman is Michael Lunn, who was ex-CEO uh, of Lighton Mackay a number of years ago. So uh, it's a really interesting project. It's going to be a, a nice-sized uh, uh, distillery. Um, it will have a capacity of about 1.5 million litres. So it's not a small distillery. It's very similar in size to what Bladnoff was and uh, we're looking at a lot of um, unique aspects of the we've gone through all the the drawing stages and such and uh, we've agreed the shapes of the stills and the outlay of the distillery it's been a bit delayed because of uh, covid and the restrictions and such and uh, but we, we hope to get underway um later this this year um i've got so that's another your, that's, your, that's your local project or, or is there more Oh, yeah, there's no, that, the, the island as well. I've got a small one that I'm involved in out in Barra, the island of Barra, where there's a small craft uh, distillery going to be out there. I've been out there, looked at the site, checked the water, everything that. 
everything's great. It's a lovely site, beautiful location, lovely water. And uh, that's in the process of uh, uh, raising capital and such. And it's a very exciting project for that too. Uh, that may, may well be um, a couple of years away as such as well. But uh, I'm also involved very much so in a, in a big distillery project um, in, in Ireland, um, in County Kildare, which is the conversion of an old maltings plant into what's going to be a, a pretty state-of-the-art dist distillery with a, an amazing visitor attraction. And, um, Monaster uh, Evan. Monaster Evan. It's going to be a multi-grain distillery where I'm going to be uh, um, overseeing the creation of a number of different whiskies there, from single malt to pot still uh, to a, a type of Irish sort of bourbon, all different styles of, uh, of whiskey. We'll be looking at rye, we'll be looking at oats, we'll be looking at all different styles. You know, there's a lot of, and uh, we're, we've got all different types of stills in there as well. So it's a great project. Um, and uh, we actually start uh, installation of that, hopefully um, about uh, July, August of this year. This year. Yeah, and I hope quite mature now, isn't it? Well, well, I hope to be commissioning um, round about uh, late November, early December of this year. So that's a great one. I also have a number of projects overseas. I'm, I'm uh, in the process of building the very first uh, single malt distillery in, in Myanmar, um, which is the old Burma. Oh, wow. but, but at the moment, because of the political unrest there, um, it's not so good. Okay, the COVID has stopped transport, but the distillery build was underway when I, had to be, I wasn't able to, to travel again. Um, and I haven't been there for about a year. Uh, I've been going to Myanmar on and off for the last, well, my, my first visit was about 13 years ago. So when I first went there, it was under military control then. And then it yeah. became, uh, uh, they became deposed and they, it became very much more westernized. And I saw a huge change in the country and, uh, and so much so that the company I'm with were building this... Uh, uh, distillery. Um, it's going to be a lovely malt distillery up in the sort of north of the country, which is a beautiful area, uh, lovely water, but we're, it's been sort of suspended at the moment. Of um, course. It's terrible. It's horrific what's happening over there right now. Absolutely. It's, it's sort of, and I've got a few other, I mean, I've got a few projects in, in Asia, uh, in Macau, um, uh, Switzerland, um, and a uh, I've been looking at a project in Argentina as well, you know, and uh, and uh, I've been looking at and uh, assisting with advice on a, a tequila uh, or a mezcal the distillery in Mexico as well. Um, so, and I also do a lot of uh, evaluation. I get a lot of spirits sent to me from different distilleries in the States, um, single malt and different um, rice and such. And I've done a I was over in the States a few times doing some prototyping in one of the smaller distilleries in uh, uh, in Colorado, uh, making prototypes for the distillery that we're going to be making in uh, in Monaster Evan in Ireland. So, yeah, pretty busy, Roy. Quite a lot of things going. Well, I tell you what, I can hear that you're busy and it's fantastic that you're involved not only locally in Scotch whiskey production like you always have been, and, but you're, you're able to kind of... Um, bring a bit of that experience uh, to other distilleries across the world. And if I could encourage anything out of you, I mean, I don't need to do this, but if I could encourage you to kind of that, that fist banging and that shouting and that fighting that you did to make the changes back when you felt passionate that, that, that it was appropriate to do that, I hope you continue doing that going forward as well. The difference that you've made and I, I don't say this lightly, and I think uh, it's clear that if if you look at the live comments here, the difference that you've made through those fights and arguments, those those beliefs, that conviction that you had back in the day, and not just to the spirits and the products that you're putting out there in the bottles, but to the lives of the people that are affected by those experiences. We're not talking about something that we drink for nutrition. We're talking about something that we only drink because it reminds us of what it is to be alive. And when it's treated in canny, careful hands, well, it is 
a wonderful thing to behold. The mm. fact that we can enjoy Deanston today, that we can, I know would have taken you a lot of fights at the time. Boon <laughs> have and Tobermory and Bladnock. I know that I'm speaking for everybody that's joined in live tonight. We were well over 300 people at the peak there. And I know that they joined in to hear what Ian McMillan had to say. And they wanted to hear just how much a hand he's had in the whiskey experiences that they've had over the years. I'm going to raise a wee glass to you to say, Ian McMillan, I wish you every success. You're not leaving us yet. You're not getting away yet. That's all right. No, this is the appropriate moment to say, I wish you every success and everything that you do uh, going forward. But when it comes to modern whiskey production versus the way it used to be, I'm grateful that people like you have been involved in order to steer it in a much more enjoyable, let's say, from my perspective, direction. Ian McMillan, thank you so much, my friend. Cheers to you. No, cheers to you. And I managed to keep the fanboy in check right up until that moment. Ian, I'm going to ask, we always close out with a quiz at the end. We always do it. If I didn't yeah. have a quiz, there would be mutiny. We park the quiz at the end because not everybody enjoys a quiz. And if you're one of those people that doesn't want to stay for the quiz, I understand completely. It's very late. We're already just past midnight now. But I'll run through the quiz quickly. It's very well, much I'm... themed on. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, no problem. Excellent. If anybody wants to stay and hang out for a wee bit of quiz, it is kind of themed on the stuff that we've been talking about tonight. There is a, a, a more than a few nods in that quiz to Ian McMillan and his career. I hope you oh, geez. Is that opened? It is opened, isn't it? It is opened, yes. This is Alleged 42. 42. <laughs> you know, uh, Stirling is only about a 30-minute commute from me, and I could be up by about a quarter to one, what do you think? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, uh, Oh, I just as a, think little, I Roy, as a little treat for you. I will send you a little, a, a little sample of this down to you to, to, to try. Well, when your package arrives, it'll have my return address on it. Uh, if I don't yep. see a package back by next week, I'll be giving you a wee phone call. <laughs> it's more often you get an offer of a 42 year old Lechick. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank no you. Hoyt has bought me a dram to see Jimmy Leg helped me figure out I have a rare bottle of Springbank 14 cast strength Fino cask. That's what the community is all about, helping each other out and pitching in. Excellent stuff. Let's try and catch some of these comments before I jump in. Jerry Miller has bought me a dram as well, said, I am certainly underpaying tonight. Not at all, Jerry. I'm very grateful for everybody that buys me a wee virtual dram to keep the lights on. and It's really, really appreciated. I am going to have no shame about pouring another wee glass of that Bladnick disappeared so fast. It's, uh, it's delicious. It's genuinely delicious. Uh, oh wow, Jimmy Legs bought me a massive uh, Jimmy, that's not a dram That's a bottle, what are you doing? Roy, you keep producing greater and greater content I think these V-pubs will be looked back upon As events in whiskey history <laughs> They capture the essence And the love of whiskey with some of the greatest people Involved uh, I'm not sure you realise what you are Accomplishing Jimmy, if it wasn't for people like Ian Having the courage to step up into this environment and do this with me, I wouldn't be encouraging very much or accomplishing very much. But I'm grateful for your encouragement, my friend, and I'm very, very grateful for that dram. You didn't need to do that, uh, but Jimmy Leg, I love having you around here, my friend, and uh, thank you very much. Cheers to Jimmy. Cheers. That's quite amazing. Neil Cochran is saying Aquavite, what a man. He's talking about you, Ian. Uh, Jerry Miller is saying I, I am underpaying. And Ryan Sutherland is saying, is Ian is absolute gent in the trade, uh, an absolute giant in the trade. Thanks for sharing your stories tonight. That was absolutely fantastic. Graham Fraser is saying, uh, I live in Stirling. I'll be around about now. <laughs> 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 he's looking out. He's looking at Atletic as well. Greg, have time for a dram. He's saying, Ian just demonstrated the passion right there with the old Lechick. Uh, you're a good one, Ian, and their lives are better for what you dedicated your life to. I owe you a dram and all, he's saying. Thanks, Gregor. Thanks to you, buddy. Yeah. Wonderful stuff. Please hang around a wee bit. Uh, stay with me. Uh, uh, give the video a wee like, a wee thumbs up. It always helps. And uh, settle in, strap in for the quiz, I promise. Based on the quizzes that we've had recently, I know they've been a wee bit brutal, but it's an easy one tonight. No, maybe not. <laughs> I think it'll be easy for you, Ian. I think it'll be easy yeah. for you. <laughs> I'd like to think so. <laughs> Greg, was, 
Greg's Whiskey again, he's saying great VPUB once again. Thanks very much, Greg. Nice to have you here. Okay, let's pull up this quiz. Uh, we didn't do as a space aid tonight. We had no time for it at all, and that's okay. Uh, oops. Uh, I'll need to reconnect. Uh, the Wi-Fi's kicked it off. It'll just take me a second. The multiple choice, Ian. You're only playing against yourself. Uh, there's no kind of, uh, <laughs> there's no kind of, the pass mark is usually five out of 10. Uh, it's always just a bit of good fun. And the questions are pitched so that even if you don't know them, um, let's see if I can get this to work. Even if you don't know them, um, you'll learn something from it. It's gonna pique a wee bit of curiosity. I'm a wee bit nervous that my Wi-Fi is flicking out on me. You can see me and hear me okay, right? I'm still connected and everything. Yeah. Yeah. You've you've been freezing a couple of times, but but it's you know, you yeah, you're okay now. Okay, that is worrying. Let's try. Let's see if it works this time. There we go. We're, we're in Ian, it's working, as long as the Wi-Fi holds up. Excellent. Uh, Mark McKenzie is had saying, easy, sure, uh -huh. people have learned not to believe me. Listen, I've tried to at least make a few of them quite easy. Let's see how we go tonight. Good luck, everybody. Uh, strap in as we roll into question one. Ian, thanks for staying. I think you might enjoy some of these questions. Doc okay. has uh, vetted this quiz and he's rated almost achievable. He thinks that some of you have a chance of getting 10 out of 10 tonight. Good luck. Question one, Ian McMillan can trace his distilling heritage back to what? A, illicit Highland distilling, B, 19th century gin distillation in England, or C, Breval's founder in 1824? I'm helping you out a wee bit there. If you, if you apply a wee bit of rationale to the answers, it might help you a bit like it always does. But I'm asking, Ian McMillan is... 48 years in whiskey making now and various distillation actually if you include his time in gin and things but he can trace his distillation heritage back to either a illicit distilling in the highlands b 19th century english gin or c Breval's founder in 1824 there might be something helpful there for everybody now, Ian, I know that, that you've already got one in the bag. You can answer this quite easily, but I think it's fascinating nonetheless. Share with us, what can you trace your heritage back to? Well, I've got uh, relatives in the past who were illicit distillers who were actually charged in, in court and spent time in prison uh, for being illicit distillers. So it's in the blood, it's in the DNA. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And I could have thrown in there that you can also trace some uh, heritage back to Isla. Is that true? Yes, that's true. There are. Uh, there are um, one of them was actually an illicit distiller on Isla as well, and he's buried in a in an Isla churchyard there. Your your future. We like to think that we have choices. I think yours was predetermined. <laughs> <laughs> your forefathers. <laughs> yeah. DJ Scott Dog is saying, "I am an illicit distiller." Well, I'm glad you're here under a pseudonym, or perhaps you're in a you're in a country like New Zealand where it's actually permitted. Well, no, then you wouldn't be illicit, would you? Benny Friesen's got me Graham to say huge thanks and respect to Ian, not just tonight, but tonight's V Pub made me realise that it's what he's done for contemporary whiskey is really invaluable. That's kind of Benny what I wanted to make a play on. Yes, there are dreamy whiskies from the past, amazing experiences, but the reason that we are able to enjoy enjoy so many um, natural whiskies as we are today is down to people like Ian. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about. Benny, thank you very much for your drama, friend. Cheers to you. Question two, with new presentation, what has happened to Buna Havin's sales volumes in the last decade? So what has happened? Obviously this doesn't come cheap to put more whiskey in the bottle to bring it to 46.3 you know, to, to invest in all those casks, to make these production changes, it doesn't come without a cost. So what has happened? A, it reduced slightly. B, it remained stable. 
or C, it increased by 160%. In the last decade, in Bunahavan alone, what has happened to their sales? I think I'm softballing it so far, Ian. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's get down again. Illicit distillers, sorry, are, are being locked up in Bunahavan prison. <laughs> I think that's the, that's the reward, Roland. That's the reward. Absolutely. I can tell you absolutely everybody in the lounge is kicked out of the park. It's guessing it quite easily. An easy question for number two. Absolutely. The only growth in Isla that beats Bunahavan's growth over the last decade is Ardbeg, that cult brand with all that money and investment behind it is Ardbeg, 160% increase in single malt sales. And more than that, I think it's much more than that, the people that are applauding Bunahavan now versus the old days. Question three, which of the Stell's malt distilleries is the oldest? These are softballs, I tell you. A, Tobermory, B, Bunahavan, or C, Deanston. Now, I originally had this set up as a bit of a banana skin. I had, I had said, suggested, I had asked, which of the Stell's malt distillery buildings is the oldest, <laughs> which would have been a different thing altogether. But I've decided to keep it kind tonight after the really difficult quizzes that we've had recently, especially we have a guest quiz host in every now and again, Ian, and uh, uh -huh. one of those guys is a fantastic guy from Belgium called Menno, and he brutalized us a few weeks ago, and I'm still getting messages in <laughs> complaining <laughs> about how, how legendary and difficult that quiz was. Ian, which is uh, our oldest distilled distillery of those three? Oh, Tobermory. 1798. Yep. Tobermory. So absolutely almost everybody in the lounge. I'm imagining that most of you are three for three tonight answered Tobermory. Incidentally, if it was going to be the oldest building, it would have been Deanston, 1785, that cotton mill, the original buildings there. Not all of the buildings, of course, but the original buildings, 1785, they date back to. That would have been a bit of an ass hat banana skin, no doubt. <laughs> Question four during his time at Port Dundas. Ian McMillan would have helped provide grain for which blend? A, Chivas Regal, B, Dewar's White Label, or C, White Horse? I need to bring in some questions that will challenge you, Ian, that will make it tricky for you. <laughs> Jimmy Legg is saying, but Menno did put up pictures of grain and ask which one was barley. Greatest quiz question ever. Actually, I did love it. I did love it a lot. So even although the questions can be really, really difficult, the idea is, Ian, that, that it challenges, um, you know, our curiosity. It makes yeah. us want to go and explore a wee bit further and understand things. What would you have provided grain whiskey for back in the day, Ian? Well, the uh, the White Horse the, um, bottling plant was right next door to Portland Das Distillery. And so it's definitely White Horse. Absolutely. Fantastic. That caught a lot of people out. Some people were answering that, that it probably was going to be Dewar's or something. But we're talking about Port Dundas, especially back in the day, would have been owned um, by the people that, as we talked about tonight, would have become the modern day Diageo. Yeah. Um, and one of their most famous blends, uh, Lagavulin, was one of the malt components in it, was White Horse, one of the most legendary uh, blends. I got to try some uh, 1960s White Horse when I was over in Italy once. Mm. And I swore it tasted like one of the most decadent, elegant aged malts. And it was just a straight White Horse blend. It was quite incredible. Obviously, some glass aging going on as well. It does change in a bottle, but it was wonderful to try. Question five. We're looking at an image here. I know that you want to blurt this out, Ian, because you're oh, yeah. immediately. <laughs> I've walked up there, yeah. <laughs> yes. I've yet to make the, the, the walk to the top, but I want to do it one day. I think it would be amazing. But I'm going to ask which distillery, which of Ian's distilleries is closest to this hill? A, Glen Turret, B, Deanston, C, Glen Goyne. Every one of them a Southern Highland distillery. A, Glen Turret, B, Deanston, or C, Glen Goyne, which is closest to this distillery. So you've walked up this. Well, the the water source for the distillery is uh, up near the 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 valley and that of that hill. And it runs down the glen, uh, down to the, uh, the distillery. 
Fantastic. I have to say that absolutely everybody's got it. I don't know if yeah. you can imagine this, but if you go to a raised an elevate a point of elevation in Glasgow and look north, you'll see this hill and it looks a lot yeah. like this. It's difficult yeah. to appreciate it from this picture, but we call it the sleeping giant because it looks like a man lying on his back and you can maybe just yeah. see there his chin sticking up as he's mm -hmm. lying back and relaxing. And that's Dumgoyne Hill right above Glen Goyne. The lounge Correct. scored it absolutely perfectly, uh, all choosing C. I think we've got Precarious Davis calling it a volcanic. Well, it is a volcanic plug. It is a big plug of volcanic rock. Um, mm -hmm. And Neil Cochran is saying climbing it on Sunday. That seems like a great Sunday, Neil. Uh, if it great. Was times. I absolutely, if it wasn't for, I don't think I could coax my three children up Dumgoyne Hill. <laughs> Uh, lots of four out of fives. I'm looking for a five out of five. Anybody? Oh, Jesse Voicing. Good to see you in, Jesse. He's on five out of five so far, as is Graham Fraser and, and Alexandre Sochu as well is on. I always worry that I pronounce your name wrong, my friend. Uh, well done, Alexander, on five out of five, along with Neil Cochran as well. He'll celebrate. Uh, if he gets a 10 out of 10, he can celebrate at the top of Glen, uh, Dumgoyne Hill. Question <laughs> six. In 2004, Bunahavan launched its Moynya expression, Meaning what in Gaelic? What does Moynya mean in Scots Gaelic? A, coast. B, turf. Or C, fire. Relatively new. Been a having back in the days. Been a having existed on the back of the puffer ships. It took decades and decades and decades before there was even a road connecting uh, to Buna Havan Distillery, everything was in and out of boats, and back in the day they could utilise coal, so it tended to be traditionally an unpeated style. But in modern times, both Brookladdy and Buna Havan have both uh, had remarkable success making peated variants. One of my favourite ever expressions, Ian, I know is at your hands as well, it blew yeah. the head off the community. It was the Moigna Oloroso, an amazing one. that You had you had the 2017 release with the beige label, and then there was a 2018 release as well that came out for Fashil that year. Absolutely amazing. I'll send you a, maybe a tiny video clip of one of the channels in the States reviewing that whiskey. One of them's got his head in his hands, literally <laughs> almost weeping, and the other yeah. one is looking off into the distance and saying, this is why I love Scotch whiskey. That, that, that was awesome. from Bart and his friend Scott. Scott from the Scotch system, he's got his head in his hands. It's just an amazing video moment on, on YouTube as they as they review that whiskey. Most people have got this absolutely right. Of course, Moynya is Gaelic for turf or oh. moss, peat as well. So I couldn't catch yeah. out with that one. I can tell you, uh, um, Roy, that what I I used to bring out all those uh, when I have an expressions in Gaelic because uh, um, when I was a little boy, my my grandfather spoke to me in in Gaelic, and I understood quite a lot of words. It's funny. I mean, I when I was a, a kid, I couldn't speak. I mean, I mean, I could speak it to back to him in Gaelic, uh, but uh, nowadays I can't. But I remember a few words. But I did. And I like to bring out because Bunna Haven's a Gaelic word, and all the expressions I brought out after that were purely to confuse the marketing team. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, conf it confuses everybody as well. And even, I mean, it's I put out a pronunciation video way back in the early days of the channel, Ian, to help people learn how to pronounce Scotch whiskey. But yeah. it wasn't a Gaelic lesson. It wasn't to teach them how to pronounce Gaelic words because these are brands. It's a bit like a given name. You know, if you have a name and you want it pronounced a certain way, then that's how it's pronounced. Whether it's true to the Gaelic roots or not, could be or might not be. But I still occasionally have Gaelic people catching that video and being utterly incensed at my pronunciation of things, <laughs> even like uh, Anok or uh, even the way I say Bunahavan rather than Bonahavan and you know, they really do get, but I have to say, look, this is just guidance. This is just, we have to relax about this. If you don't get poured a dram of whiskey because you can't pronounce Buna Havan Toshi Kada, then you're, the, you're in the wrong bar. You know, the, it can't be like that. It's, it's okay to not to be able to pronounce these things. Of the amount of so. names that I have people joining me in the lounge, I don't know how to pronounce their names. I don't think they're getting offended if I'm making a mess of it. Um, if they tell me and I learn how to pronounce it and then I choose to pronounce it differently afterwards, I think that's when the lack of respect comes in and it's a problem. 
once we learn these things. And I think that's the reason I did these videos is to help people just as a suggestive guide. But Buna Haven could be a video all in its own right, honestly speaking. <laughs> the amount of Gaelic expressions that's come out. But it makes for great fun. Seven, Brookladdy was founded in 1881, but is now using an inherited mash tun dating from which year? So the founding of Brookladdy was 1881. But where, when does the mash tun date from? A, 1881. B, 1900, or C, 1981. Brookladdy's mash tun. Now, interestingly, Deanston, just last, the year before last, 2019, they put in a new open top ca uh, cast iron mash tun at Deanston. Um, and I know it was desperately needing replaced, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the original had been there from day one, from 1966. Yeah, yeah. Hoyt is saying, I think your pronunciation guide very helpful. Thanks, Hoyt. Thanks very much. At least some people like it. <laughs> and Jimmy Legg is saying, my name is actually pronounced Jimmy Chig. <laughs> his nom de plume, his uh, alias. Uh, Alexandre sought you a uh, drop a touch of sherry bomb on it. Do you know this one, Ian? Would you be guessing this one? Uh, for, for, for me, it would be 1981. Well, I can tell you that Brookladdy is still maintaining the original Bunahaven mash tun that was put in place in 1881. Now, it might be one of these things that not a single part is original, but yeah. they have still got the uh, a mash tun from 1900 that was um, originally a Bunahaven 1881 mash tun. Both distilleries were founded in the same year. They were That's both right. founded in 1881. Um, you know, I, for the size, I mean, Bunnahaven originally was not uh, that uh, large a distillery as it, with the mass size now. And Brookladdy, I mean, I'm just picturing being there and uh, I don't. I mean, I'm. I would question that one, Roy. But I mean, if that's what they're claiming, but I would, I would question that one. I cannot see cast iron iron uh, lasting as long as that. So there we go. Uh, with Ian questioning that, that means that you know what happens on the VPub. As soon as there's any suspicion that something might be afoot, everybody gets a free point. So it doesn't matter whether you answered 1881, 1900 or 1981, you get a free point there. If you have a wee look at the Brook Laddie website, um, most recently that's where I took um, the information on this. But like like we're talking about here, it might be the case that there's uh, there's lots of, th so many things being replaced on the original mash tun that it bears no resemblance to the original one. But yeah, we talk about it being replaced since... But as, as, as we talked about there, as the replacement at Deanston only been in place since the 60s, I mean, a 50-year life versus a 140-year life is, is quite yeah. incredible, right? Yeah, yeah. So everybody gets a free go at that. Um, and Neil Cochran is saying, Ian is a man after my own heart. <laughs> Tim Donopat <laughs> is saying, uh, love what I Whiskey She Wines did with your pronunciation video. They're going to make another with the second one too. Uh -huh. I Whiskey She Wines, the channel out in the States, took my pronunciation video and used it as a bit of a challenge with their friends. Americans trying to pronounce, pronounce Scotch whiskies. It was quite fun. Uh, you should go and have a, a wee look there. Question eight. Bladnick was sold by United Distillers to Raymond Armstrong in 1994, but under what condition? So this was the United Distillers, again, that's what, one of the companies that became Diageo, but what was the condition that they sold uh, Bladnick under? A, that he changed the style of the distillate. B, that one third of the production is guaranteed allocated to UD or uh, United Distillers, or C, that it never distills again. Raymond Armstrong bought Bladnock under one of those conditions. I know that Ian knows this because we talked about it, I think maybe yeah. before we went live, actually. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Triggers Brim, says James Alsop, absolutely. <laughs> 
So I'm going to I'm going to ask you to reveal this. This is a super interesting thing. It's one of those things if you know you know, but it's shocking, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it was it was it was under the condition that it would never distill again. In fact, uh, United Distillers um, removed um, all the equipment and such from the distillery. And uh, when Raymond got it, he wanted to bring it back as a sort of heritage center. But all the it's quite incredible that all the electrical equipment that was removed when all the big control panels and such were removed from the distillery. Uh, but let me tell you that when I uh, got it going again, I got all the original electrical equipment back out, back again, all the control panels, all updated, updated, but it was the same original control panel that was put back into Ladnock that wow. United Distillers had taken away. And we bought and we bought back, we brought it back again. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that's the kind of wee insightful things that you would only get through somebody that's actively gone and so how how did you source them? Were they in storage or something? Yeah, well they they hadn't used it and uh, obviously I was working along with uh, Forsyth who I know really, really well. And uh, we checked out of what was what was available. Um, no, we I know a lot of people in United Distillers or, or Diageo, and now nowadays, and uh, we found that it was still available, and uh, we 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 brought it back. Um, um, it, it was uh, it's fantastic to have it there. Yeah, so I have I to mean, say it's quite an incredible. Know, sorry, I mean, ahead. it wasn't me that brought it back, uh, Roy. It was brought back by Raymond when he convinced them again in 2000 that he wanted to distill again. And, and then he was given a, a permission to distill again, but with a caveat that it would be no more than 100,000 litres of alcohol. So they reinstalled the, the electric panel and they put in the stills, which they weren't the original stills, because because I know that when I looked at the stills when we took it over, there was about, it was like... Uh, Perm two stills from about six different parts of stills, and <laughs> that's what was installed. Uh, but that was the that was the thing. It was the original panel was taken away uh, when they closed the distillery, and then Raymond uh, bought it, and uh, they got their their original electrical panel back again. And, and the amazing we, thing is, is that this was a petition. This was Raymond campaigning and campaigning to let yes. you United Distillers or Diageo at that time the ability to let them produce again. The community are petitioned. Everybody got behind this campaign to bring Bladnock back on stream. And it's interesting you mentioned 100,000 litres because I think it's over a million litres now, right? It's, it's 1.4 is the capacity of the distillery now. I mean, Raymond um, campaigned against the the uh, operations director was a, a very well-known character in the industry in those days. Uh, it was a guy called Turnbull Hutton. Turnbull was a was a, a, a an amazing man, but uh, he was quite resolute. But he he softened uh, somewhat, and he allowed uh, Raymond to commence distilling again in two two thousand after a you know a, a, all the years that I, that I had that I had stopped. You know, um, I think the the last distillate produced there was nineteen ninety three was the last product that was distilled. So there was a seven year um hiatus yeah hiatus or you know a silent period and then he distilled small volume in two, 2000 after that but yeah it was quite an amazing uh con condition that absolutely amazing um andrew uh hamaker is saying i slip hard on that banana skin uh, graham young is saying wow that is quite a close oh, yeah <laughs> and Graham Fraser is saying, "Few eight out of eight. I got that info from Raymond himself. Good for you, Graham." Neil Cochran is saying, "Ask Ian if he fancies a night of the Bonacord. Once things are back to normal, I could listen to him forever. I'll pay for the drink, <laughs> no matter what I could be to." Enjoy the Bonacord. Yeah, it's a it's a great pub. Uh, we're all desperate to get back in the, that environment again. Uh, Neil, I hope I'm invited as well. I'll, I'll pay for drums. I don't mind. I'll come along. <laughs> Greg is saying, what's the story behind the Agio distillery stuff there and the famous Bladnock Forum? Eh, so many great bottlings with bargain prices. Absolutely. Neil Cochran is saying, eh, eh, would fly in for that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Alexandru is saying to Neil Cochran that he would fly in for that night at the Bonacord. 
Yeah. <laughs> and you never know, you, you never know, you might yeah. be. Um, um, you might, I, I enjoy the, the Bon Accord, definitely. Uh, absolutely, we all do. And uh, that would be amazing for that. It might happen at a festival or something as well one day. You never you never know. That would be tremendous. Um, Neil, uh, sorry, it was uh, Greg that was asking about Bladnick Forum. I think uh, topics like that, especially things like that, that come from these kind of famous uh, stories we could cover at a different time. Um, I'm, I'm realising that I'm heading for a three-hour V-pub, Ian. Three hours. <laughs> question nine. Second from last question. Ian McMillan is involved in a distillery development project which involves which musician? We didn't actually say this. A, Jim Kerr of Simple Minds. B, Bono of U2. C, Brian May of Queen. So one of Ian's distillery projects, he touched on the projects that he's working on. One of them involves a collaboration with one of these famous musicians. So Scotsman Jim Kerr of Simple Minds, Irishman Bono of U2, or Englishman Brian May of Queen. I, I can't, uh, the knowledgeable whiskey folk already know this one. They've read the news stories. <laughs> it's been busted. So have, have you, uh, you tell us who it is and tell us if you've managed to meet the man yet. Yes, I've uh, been very, very fortunate uh, to uh, work along with Bono from U2. Um, I've uh, been out to his 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 home in the uh, in the, the Mediterranean uh, wow. in Nice, and uh, and I've had a few um, uh, Zoom calls with him uh, over the last few months uh, because obviously um, traveling over to Ireland has not been possible for the last year. Uh, but uh, he's very excited about this whole project. Um, um, he's involved along with a, with a, a business partner of his as well um, in the project, but he's very excited about the whole thing. He's a, he's a really, really nice, nice guy, uh, and uh, he likes a, 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 a good dram as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I've been fortunate to have uh, drunk a few with him, which has been great. <laughs> Superb. And of course, we're talking about Monaster Evan and Kildare as well. Um, yes. So it's going to be super interesting to see, especially when you talk about uh, oat distillation and things. I think oh, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it so much. Uh, Rican Addicts is saying, I, I can't forgive Bono after they forced their new album onto iPhones years ago. <laughs> some, <laughs> some people have long memories, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I kind of I've got a vague recollection of that happening. I think it was about fifteen years ago, wasn't it, Lewis? Jesse Voice is saying, uh, uh, "Bring on the ass hat, sir." So the last question has become a bit of legendary thing because it's usually one of these really almost impossible to answer ass hat questions. The idea is, is that these people thinking that they're going to get a full house ten out of ten suddenly hit the ass hat after nine out of nine. But tonight, I've decided that the ass hat will be kept in check. I think I've been very kind on the last question tonight. I don't think we have to face an ass hat. I'm hoping that some of you get the ability to use the 10 out of 10 emoji tonight. Fingers crossed. Question 10. Black Bottle Blended Scotch was originally created in 1879 by brothers skilled in mixing what? A, T, B, metals, or C, fruit juices? I guess you have to know, to know, but we're talking about the blenders coming from these delicatessens, these grocers, these little independent uh, outlets. So they were already in late 19th century, early 19th century, mid 19th century, blending something regularly. And it is in terms of, I don't want to say too much, I don't want to lead you, but it looks like absolutely most people have. I'm talking about the Graham, Graham brothers from Aberdeen. And of course, uh, the, uh, you inherited Black Bottle as a brand eventually, Ian. Um, and we yes. became, it became, I think you were responsible for making it PT again. Um, yeah. <laughs> but back in the day, the Graham brothers were responsible for blending tea. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so, yeah. did anyone manage, did anyone manage a 10 out of 10? I'm going to remove this, bring Ian back in. I wonder if anybody managed to get a 10 out of 10 tonight. Andrew Pierce on eight. Joseph Van Name on eight. Helen's Wood on eight. Lots of eights. Gino, Gino's on eight. Good to see you in Gino. Uh, Gino Camo. Jerry Miller. Oh, what a jump. Wow. 
Okay, I've lost everyone now. Uh, Hoyt on eight. Precarious Dave. Uh, think new PB, just a smidgen short. Ten. Personal best for Precarious Dave. Excellent. Nine out of ten for Steve Atkiss. Peter Box on eight. I'm looking for a ten. Somebody surely got it. Graham Fraser, of course. Well done. Finally celebrating. He's using the emoji. Ten out of ten. <laughs> He scored a 10 out of 10 tonight. Excellent. Eventually, we managed to bring somebody back into the fold. Graham, your prize for getting a 10 out of 10 is that, guess what? You're able to contribute some questions <laughs> to the VPUB quiz at the end. Fantastic. Congratulations to you and congratulations on, to everybody else. DJ Scott Dog looks like he got 10 out of 10 as well. Amazing. Yash Desai is in, bought me a drama. He said, Ian McMillan is most certainly a whiskey legend. But so are you, Roy, bringing superb content for us week after week. I can only imagine the amount of work involved behind the scenes. Listen, when it's people like Ian, it's a walk in the park. It's a piece of cake, honestly speaking. I also have to say, by the way, thanks to Ingvar Ron for putting us in touch. I had no way yeah. to get in touch with you. And it was uh, thanks to Ingvar uh, 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 that put us in touch as well. I'm very, very grateful to uh, Ingvar as well over there in Norway. Fantastic. Um, I'm very grateful, Yash, that you appreciated Ian coming on tonight. And thank you so much for your kind words. Cheers to you, Yash. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Jerry Miller has seen my scores have skyrocketed since getting the malt whiskey yearbooks. That's the trick to this. Ingvar's annual book, you know the places that I mean. Occasionally I'll go online, occasionally I'll go into different books, occasionally I'll dig into the memory banks, but absolutely it's a wonderful reference guide for uh, making up quiz questions. Ian, I hope you've had a, a bit of fun tonight. I've had a lot of fun uh, talking to you, just hearing you sharing your experiences and your stories. I know that we've only scratched the surface and I know that the framing that we used tonight forced it down a certain direction. But the more that we talked about that, comparing modern malt whiskey production versus uh, days gone by, the more I realised that Ian McMillan was the perfect guest to have on to talk about those contrasts and the changes and how we look at malt whiskey for malt whiskey's sake in these days. I'm very grateful to you for coming on and spending all the time that you did. Look at the time, it's almost one o'clock in the morning, Ian, and you're oh, still hanging out with us. That's at all. It was, it was an absolute pleasure. It's great to sort of uh, know that you've got so many guys that um are, are so avid followers and and uh of your pro your program is fantastic roy you know and uh you know thank you so much and, and I, I think i think we should do it do it again in the future uh, and cover some other topic <laughs> absolutely tremendous it, it's it's fun to hear how many people actually say that ian and i think having you back on to talk about honestly anything you wanted to talk about would actually be our pleasure. And it's been an absolute privilege to have you on and talking about all the time uh, and all your experiences in the industry, but we are more grateful than you might imagine for some of the hard work and the changes that you've put in in order to put things like this in the glass for us. Uh, well, I'll raise I'm my pleased, glass. I'm Sorry. Pleased that, I'm pleased at all that, that people do appreciate the, the work, you know, I. I always just went with my heart. I knew what I what I wanted to to achieve, and I I was always the the great believer that the consumer should always taste whiskey the same as I did. You know, why would they get something that was dil diluted or whatever? It, that's what I wanted to be. I mean, so and I'm glad that a lot of that has gone out, and a lot of the places that I started this off have continued to do it, which is which is great. Fantastic, absolutely. Ian, as I raise this glass, you're going to drop into the background, but please stay a wee while, let the credits roll, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll raise a glass to you offline. Um, but on behalf of all the barflies, on behalf of all my community um, and everybody, uh, Ian McMillan, have you got, oh, you're pouring something fantastic. Oh, it's a 17-year-old lad. 17-year-old, yeah, I've got a 17-year-old lad now, yeah. They're, Excellent stuff. A wonderful whiskey. So, so all the Ian best. Cheers, Roy. Congratulations and, and thank you guys. so much. Thank you so much. I'll speak to you soon, Ian. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Wonderful stuff. Andrew Hamacker is saying, thank you, Ian, your contribution to whiskey is beyond incredible. Hoyt is saying, thanks, Ian, you're a whiskey treasure. 
Uh, ben Demon Hunter is saying, Slanche to all the barflies. Ian and Roy, thank you all. Ryan Sutherland is saying, Can I get any better? Two legends and a great crack. Well done, Roy. Ian, what a V pub. And Jerry Miller is saying, Yes, more Ian. <laughs> Rican Haddix is saying, Oh, sorry, sorry, Rican Haddix. It jumped again there. It's always happening. Superb V pub. Ian has some cracking stories and set a precedent for the Stell brands. Dirty Dog is saying, what a good VPUB. Thank you, Ian, for all your passion and skill and whiskey. Slanch of that. Thanks to my fellow at Sterling Onion, <laughs> Ian. Such a great live session. Obviously, appreciated. Appreciation to you, Roya. Thank you, Graham. Thank you so much. Um, lots of you. I want a few hours with Ian's whiskey cabinet. <laughs> you and I too, Andrew, Andrew Piers. Bruno Martins from Portugal saying, thanks, Ian, for helping bring that natural presentation and cheers. Too Slow Rob is in. Thanks, Roy and Ian, for a great show. Yash is saying, three wonderful hours. And Thomas Elmer is in. Ross Fudd is saying, good times, Roy. Helen is saying, thanks for another great VPUB. What a fabulous, honest, and knowledgeable guest in Ian. I'll be back next week one week from this evening eh, to talk about um, more of a community thing. I'm flying solo, but I'm going to bring in some people from the community and we're going to talk about whiskey collections, managing whiskey co collections, the anxiety it brings, the difficulties, the challenges it brings, the pleasure it brings, the wonderful selections that we have, how we treat them, how we uh, look at them, how many bottles we keep open versus close, all the things that come with managing a whiskey collection and our attitudes towards it. Uh, two weeks after that, I'm reaching out to a guest in order to bring some Irish whiskey to you uh, to talk about. Um, obviously, it's coincidentally very, very close to St. Patrick's Day two weeks from tonight, and that's obviously the reason for it. But I'm reaching out to a fellow evangelist in Barry Chandler uh, to bring him on to talk about where Irish whiskey is today. If you look at the transformation from Scotch of the early 80s, to where it is today. You think there's a contrast? Wait till you see the contrast in Ireland. It's fascinating. Um, so I'm looking forward to the next couple of weeks as well, and I hope that you'll be joining me too. I'm very, very sure that you will. I've got one wee tiny sip of this very delicious, and incidentally, my second dram of Vlad McTen tonight to raise to you all, to say thank you all for spending all this time. It's over three hours tonight, but I think it was worth it. And I think it'll stay here on YouTube for posterity going forward, and I hope you enjoy it. But I'll raise this wee dram to say thank you all for your patience. Thank you all for hanging out with me tonight. So many of you stayed till the very end too. Thank you to Ian for his amazing, amazing contribution and his amazing insight tonight. And I look forward to all, welcoming you all, all of you dearly loved, beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated barflies a week from tonight. Until then, Slanchiva. Good night. <laughs>